Hello, welcome. Sunday night here in the UK, and other time zones are allowed. Um, welcome. We're going to be having a hell of a good debate tonight. Um, you may have seen advertised. Let me just remind you where we're going to go. In the first hour or so, we will be debating, does the role of showrunner or producer serve Doctor Who best? There's excesses out there. There's mistakes made. There's some brilliant maneuvers and decisions and creations made by many of them. We're going to try and kind of ruminate and stir the pot and all of that and try and come up with a decision. Please join in. What do you actually think out there? Is it better in this new iteration of Doctor Who that we have a showrunner? Or is it a produce? Now, I'll define it in a minute just to kind of help the debate. But then in the second half of uh, our discussion, after that, we'll be straight into the big news. And there's quite a lot of it about. Um, uh, take your pick there. So in the, in the second hour, Millie Gibson, Verada Sethu. Oh, my God, Millie Gibson's not sacked. She's back. What's going on there? We'll try and get root, you know, get to the bottom of that. Birthday boy Peter Davison confessing confusion about the bi generation. <laughs> Some very interesting thoughts we can have about that. Jinx Monsoon keeps changing their emblem and name, but they are now known as the Maestro. And uh, who the hell's a Maestro? How does that fit in? And that fits in with our next news item, which is what's our latest season predictions. Uh, you've got some of them there. I'm not teasing anybody. I don't play with you on this show. You know, if you want to stay with us, thank you very much. But basically, we'll be discussing is the 14th Doctor the Valyard, Sutek, the big boss at the end of the series, Ruby Sunday, a Time Lord. And of course, uh, Russell Davies trying to explain his plot device with the Devil's Chord mm. because of the Beatles copyright. So there's quite a lot to get into. I'm talking fast because I need to really be joined by my panelists and my friends. So let's get rooting through. I'll say hi to you all. So basically, I will say hello, hello, time scales. Good morning. Good to see you. Yes, it's your morning. We, we, we're all knackered here. So, <laughs> and mm -hmm. let's have a look. Here is Jeremy as well. Let's have a look. Oh. Look at oh, that. Jeremy. I the life. <laughs> was right. that? I the life of a producer. Which one was that one? Uh, John Nathan Turner. John Nathan Turner, I'm sure he's going to get a mention tonight. Hello. And of course, hello, Cinnamon. Hello. Hello. How are you yeah, all? See, we can't have Cinnamon without a time lag. He's in a different time zone. He's in East Space. I'm going to start calling him Madrick. Um, and then, hello, Hugh. How are you? Evening, everyone. Morning to those that's morning. He was definitely in a different time zone. He's called, it's called Scotland. Uh, and then we've got Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hello, hey, Rachel. everyone. Hello. It doesn't feel like two minutes since I last spoke to you. <laughs> no, it doesn't, does it? Does it? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, there's Brandon, who I was also talking to yesterday. Hey, hey what's up, guys? Hello. Uh, this yeah. is the you know, I advertised this is a big show. I said this is the one where Cinnamon Toast Crunch discovers milk. So this is going to be a big one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very true. So, I mean, we've got a lot to discuss tonight, haven't we? I mean, um, yes, my gosh, where do we start? So, um, I think it's important if, to set this up that uh, we set a few things in place here. So, of course, we're trying to, to grow as a channel. We really want to entertain you. We are passionate about Doctor Who, and that is our foremost thought all the time. And of course, we only grow as a channel if you subscribe. Please check you have subscribed. There's the Sisters of Plenitude. Now, I always have a deal with our Sense Fear followers. Um, if you subscribe, believe it or not, I'm like a bit of a Del Boy galactically, <laughs> Sablon uh, Glitz, I suppose. But basically, what I'm saying is I can turn those subscriptions into galactic credits. And you may not have heard, because some of us fans, we're fickle, we move on. Since New Earth, yeah, I mean... The Sisters of Plenitude, they don't have plenty anymore. In fact, the Sisters of Plenitude are on strike. They need um, more money. That We need to upgrade their pay and uh, working conditions. So while it was lockdown and we were banning our pans, pans and you know stuff outside of our doors, did we do it for the Sisters of Plenitude? Did we not? And so we need to help them out. Uh, and get them all kind of sorted out. Get them a new hospital, uh, get them a new ward. So please, if you haven't subscribed, it's not for me. How dare I just beg for me? This is for the Sisters of Plenitude. Of course it is. So please, one little click, one little notification, and the Sisters of Plenitude will get more money. Big deal there. There you go. Right. And on top of that, um, let me just say, let's set up our debate properly on showrunners and producers 
I'm just checking out our thread. Are we getting opinions? Bring them in. Tell us where you stand. Who are the top people? Who are the ones we wished hadn't been in charge of Doctor Who? What were the best moments, best decisions? We get some and just to set the tone of the debate and make sure we do everything properly, I need to go quickly to my Sunday sermon. Yeah, it's very important. Our, our, our time scales is panicking, thinking, is it? Am I doing that? Am I doing the sermon today? Right, it's one week in might, I tell you. So we're all here about Doctor Who because of our passion for Doctor Who. Doctor Who is escapism for many of us. Now, this week, some Doctor Who streams went heavy on a serious report on NHS provision for trans children and its efficacy in the UK. We wondered if we could mention it. Well, actually, I have to say the sense for you, we read all 388 pages and from that realised it only had a tangential link to Doctor Who, if you stretch the point, and missed the point of the report itself. And Hilary Cass, who wrote the report, has stated that children are being used as a political football already. We will not therefore do that. We will judge the showrunners and producers in our debate on their triumphs, their mistakes, their excesses, and possibly where they overstretched their remit. As Doctor Who fans, we will passionately debate that, for that is what we are here for. For those who want the news, there are very good 24-hour streaming platforms already out there. This is our Doctor Who space. Okay? So, that's what you're getting tonight. Nothing else. Okay? Now... Before I ask you all your first opinions and bring in everybody, yes, well, I've, I'm glad you recognise this, Michael Q, Brother Brendan. There has been an argument in our house that every week I should dress up as a vicar for a moment, but there's just <laughs> changes that go on. But a bit like Dick Henry for the older ones. Dick Henry, remember that vicar with the teeth? Oh, so, you are awful. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. So, <laughs> Brandon head, keeps I'm me right. What you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon keeps me right. We can't have a debate about showrunners versus producers in Doctor Who without just kind of clarifying a few things. So uh, let's get this all out the way. So it might just help because we've got American viewers, Australian viewers, we've got British viewers who might not have been watching Doctor Who when we have producers. There we go. So I quickly looked at a few things. So you can see the present showrunner set up. They're established writers. They are one of the top executive producers. They outrank everybody else creatively. They have control of all the production. They're responsible for all aspects of it. They are the boss. When you had people like Verity Lambert, they were part of a departmental hierarchy. The BBC One controller was in charge of them. The head of drama was in charge of them. But yes, they, they had an eye on budget, casting, writer selection, uh, various things. But they were part of a school of producers at the BBC. OK, so it was a it was a very different setup. And so it's very interesting when you actually look at uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. That um, <laughs> it, you, You're comparing different beasts, really. So let's get started off. Let's freshen this up. There's been too much talk for me and we'll soon get going. So, um, Hugh. I'll, I'll come to you because this is like celebrity squares and you're right in the middle. And you, you're, the, you're the strategic square. <laughs> so basically, uh, what I'll say to you is, right, just a nice concise one to start us off and get the thread all tasty on this one. Um, I, what I find is you look at the first Doctor Who producer, Verity Lambert, and you look at our latest showrunner and you compare the two. And who are you happiest with, with what they've been doing and have done? Right. So, I mean, I, I think it, it's difficult to underestimate the impact that Verity Lambert had been brought in by Sydney Newman specifically to do Doctor Who, um, being the youngest producer, I think, at the BBC, as, as well as, as the quite, I think, the only woman at that stage, and, and, and to come out and do what what was for Doctor Who something deeply significant. The other thing in terms of that, though, is it, at the time, you didn't just have writers, you had a stripped editor. The first one, I think, is David Whitaker, which is enormously important as well. Yeah. And now you have this idea of showrunner. My take is that um, showrunners come from a background, generally, of 
coming up with the idea themselves and it being their universe. So there's tons of stuff like The Wire and Sopranos, but if you want to look at something in terms of sci-fi, you'd look possibly at Babylon 5 with Michael Straczynski. That, I think, has, has a lot of sense. I think whenever Doctor Who came back, having a showrunner, which was a much more sort of like it was much trendier and, and something that was was much more on trend at the time, I think possibly having Russell Davis as a showrunner then made sense. Um, I'm not sure it made sense going forward. I think to re-establish Doctor Who needed something, but I think it's it works better as a committee, and I think it's reducing the number of writers who work on Doctor Who. And the great thing about Doctor Who is the openness to, to new writers. Well, let's think about this then, everybody, uh, and, and please come in when you can. I won't go around, around the houses in the usual way. There's too many of us, and you, some of them you mean me more hot to trot so please just put in and with cinnamon because of the time lag if i wave you know that's the kind of if you can uh, bring it together and, and we'll move on tightly you know i'll try and do that so um, well, i've just checked my microphone now so maybe that's a little bit better that sounds a bit faster yeah <laughs> so the question is the question is um verity lambert launched doctor who and was very much part of its creation um and Russell Davies relaunched Doctor Who and is very much part of recreating it now. What's your preference, Rachel? Oh, 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 oh. Verity or Russell? Uh, probably Verity. I, I tend to prefer a, a producer over a showrunner as well because... Um, what a, what a producer allows for, a producer like Verity, is obviously, as Hugh said, like bringing in the different writers, um, there is more scope for imagination, more scope for building upon um, different aspects of the story that perhaps, you know, um, Verity might not have actually thought of. Whereas with Russell T. Davis, he's very good. I'm not going to say that he's not very good. Uh, he brought it back with a bang with one of the scariest... Um, aliens that I, I could actually uh, see on the screen ever like but um he uh he, he's more limited as a showrunner because what he says goes essentially and whilst he may be open to ideas he doesn't have to take them on board if he doesn't want to um so i think um verity is definitely the better one for me so, I mean, and, and you know, I'm not going to keep repeating the question. Don't worry, panellists, yeah. and, and just come in. But basically, I'm saying this in a nutshell. We will look into the minutiae of producers versus showrunners. And those in the thread, we will look at various periods of Doctor Who. Don't worry. But this is just as kind of started off. It's a quite a tasty question when you look at producer versus showrunner to look at the latest person versus the very first one. Does anyone want to come on on that with a kind of, highlight where they would go with this conversation. Go on, Cinnamon. Well, it's a very good question. Um, I was quite surprised, actually, when I, when I did see the thumbnail for this stream, because it's a very good topic, really. It's a little bit different from one that I think we've done. Uh, it's 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 yeah. a, it's quite a subjective one, because, it, and to be fair, I would say the simple answer, I think they're all wrong, is, is pros and cons to both. So whether you're whether you're personally in the camp or producer, there'll be many that are for that, and there'll be cons against that. And again, same way for for, the, for a show, we know there'll be some pros and cons for that. Um, again, I would say I'm somewhat slightly biased because I've only ever watched the show and known the show under a show when I grew up under the Verity Lambert or you know Philip Hinchcliffe, Barry Letts, John Nathan Turner, and you know it's, it's also you've got to also think about it in the time that TV was made, 60s, 70s, 80s. Television was just a different beast, you know, to what we're getting now. I and mean, when we when we talk about Americanizations in Doctor Who, look all this, you know, this was this. I guess one of them, you know, the showrunner, I think, is a more American concept. It was it's not a recent thing, you know, we went we got it in 2005, and it worked for its benefit, you know. Again, when we were, I was saying before about. Doctor Who coming back in 2005 with a bang, and this was one of those changes. So, um, yeah, it, it depends. It, it's a very individual thing. What would you 
what would you say to Bobby D's uh, 75 here? I agree with what Time Scales has said. The showrunner shouldn't be writing most of the stories. The Tamura people, which goes way back, did that with the creator yeah. of the show and began to run out of ideas. RTD, after his first hey, interview, said he was running out of ideas. Um, Stephen Moffat was exhausted. He was also doing Sherlock, I appreciate. So um, Chris, Chris Chibnall, <laughs> I think... Chris Chibnall had too many ideas in one respect. I didn't want to go. But, um, well, I mean, what would you say? Because obviously the producer in the old days, whether it was Verity Lambert, whether it was John Wiles, Barry Letts, whoever, they weren't really writing them. I know Barry Letts and a couple have, have had their fingers on the pie a bit, but they, they, they had the kind of you know, overview of everything and casting, whereas a showrunner has a bit more power. So... But that means they're exhausted. It just means they're exhausted. Yeah. Um, and, and just to put it, I won't get too bogged down into it, but to put it in football terms, you know, long previously a one manager would have a little bit more control over everything. Whereas nowadays it's, it's they're more defined in just a coaching role and they'll have other people who take care of all the other side of the business. Whereas it's a little bit like this, you know, at one point, you know, it used to be like that where it would be the, someone who would look after the face. It, it's not like a manager. Um, looked after the general view of the show, and then you'd have the person who's actually writing the scripts, and then you'd have someone else who's in the, obviously in the production team. Whereas it's the opposite of that has now happened. Now it's someone taking control of a lot more. Someone who's got a lot more say. The big boss at the top of the thing who's you know in charge of everything. Yeah, you're, you're pointing at the um, at the comment there. The major I'm, difference I'm point, to me is yeah, that to it. yeah, JWC reviews. The major difference to me is. That a bit like what you were saying is that a producer is a bit like a project manager overseeing but not inputting. I mean, they'll choose maybe the doctor and we can talk about some of those examples later. They might change it, the tone of the show, blah, blah, blah. A showrunner is too close to the project, e.g. RTD. And RTD is going to come up, I think, a fair bit, especially in relation to maybe things recently. I will just shout out just so we don't look as though we're going to be general for too long to our thread but an example to would that be verity lambert would fight her corner and very and had to fight her corner and verity lambert would have had major input into how certain things were created um but she had a line manager well she had quite a few line managers and she didn't win every battle the famous one is she won the battle about the daleks and the bug-eyed monsters and sydney newman said you know the show i'll back off but that was that was you know she had to fight her corner whereas rtd a, a few fans or maybe i'm <laughs> are concerned that if he has an opinion or he has a message or he wants to push the show in a certain direction who puts the brakes on him and unlike the old days it will be the head of channel one uh, BBC One, it will be the head of drama. Now it should be Jane Tranter and that team of Julie Gardner. But when me and Hugh were, what, were doing our show ages ago on the Russell Davies documentary, they all were basically blowing air in certain places. <laughs> and um, <laughs> sorry, they they That's just nice. think he's amazing. So, you know, Brandon, you're listening patiently over there. I mean, what's your preference? I think maybe they need to restructure the way they're doing it. Like, uh, I don't know what do you, uh, like the, the, the decision making. Yeah. It's always great to have like one person, one final say to yay or nay things, but maybe they need the actual people like who are creating the show to not just be one guy. Who's also the right of the producer. I just think they need to fracture the hats that one guy's wearing, you know? So it's a lot like what scales is always saying about, like the showrunner thing just kind of it's like i said last week it's a king a monarchy is great when you've got a good king but when a bad one comes along you want democracy all of a sudden you know what i'm saying so if he was doing things right and we were all down it, it works great but the way they've got their whole system structured now when it's not working for a lot of us it's just they need to maybe make some changes i just don't know what those changes would be oh oh uh guys uh Shout out to John Yolden. He was sick. Just want to let him know we're thinking yeah. about him, man. He's watching. He's in the chat. He's in, he's yeah, in, the, he's chat. in the chat. Type, type yeah, and also hi to Kersey in the chat. Um, Brendan, if I can chime in here on this, um, I'm here for the education today, and I'm already learning a lot because as an American, I don't know what the difference is between the showrunner and the producer with British television. And it's you've explained it here, yes, but this is something I haven't really thought of until just the last uh, couple of days here. 
So I am learning and, and I appreciate the education on that. And uh, to echo what Brandon just said, um, I don't want to keep repeating it over and over, but I think that whoever is running the show should run the show. And I think there are tremendous opportunities for other types of stories to be told by other writers. And I don't believe that the people running the show, whichever capacity, as the showrunner and or the executive director should be writing most of the stories. So uh, there I said it again. So they're not uh, they're not nurturing and cultivating new talent either. Like they're not yes. bringing in the next the next yeah, Moffat, the next uh, Mark Gaddis or something. They're not giving them a chance, it seems. And they're not bringing back the old, really proven talent uh, like True from that the too. novels and Big Finish and what have you. So, so yeah. in I mean, it's a it's a meaty discussion, and, and, I, think, and I think as a general rule, there's nothing wrong with having multiple people. In fairness, you know, I, I I will say that regardless of what side you're on, I think you know as a general point, there's nothing wrong with having more voices. That that'll be one of those pro. That I was speaking about it's something you know, you know when it's just you when you're the big boss like I'm J and T it was the boss but he also probably couldn't write he probably admit it himself he's not a writer you know he, he dabbled in acting it wasn't for him he was behind he, he knew that his role was behind the camera um you know again that, it, it was different 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 roles the, work for different the, people the thing is you know, when you look at the promoting producer. the actual brand of it. But, when you look at the producer role in the past, I mean, all Doctor Who fans of different ages will see Barry Letts worked closely with Terence Dix. Philip Hinchcliffe worked closely with Robert Holmes. Now, it might be funny, but JNT and Eric Sayward and Christopher H. Bidbead, but, you know, they, they did discuss things. Yes, there was some falling out as well. But there tended to be a bit more of a pairing going on. Then Andrew Cartmel with JNT later on when he came up with the master plan. I think the problem now when I hear people's criticisms is that the showrunners now, Chibnall, RTD, Moffat, whether they're getting tired or not doing too much, are not getting challenged or, when I say criticised, just challenged in that way to just check what they're doing and the logic of what they're doing. The, my famous example is Terence Dix and Barry Letts sitting down saying, do you know what? We need a Moriarty to Doctor Who. We need a new Moriarty character. And they invented the master. Now, that was a master stroke. Now, has RTD got anybody saying, you know, by generation, I'm not too sure. You, you know, that kind of thing. It, it, it's so, I, you know, please get into the. Yeah, we don't need anyone to say, oh, you're wrong. It doesn't seem to be. Doing. It just, you know, someone else just to concentrate your mind a bit more. Just someone, you know, to, to share those ideas, bounce, or, you know, the rock, because it, because it helps you as a person if you're not just, you know, living yeah, it's in just your like own us. echo chamber, yeah. so to speak. You know, the, you know, I bounce ideas. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like us. We, you know, I bounce ideas. I'm not always, you know, 100% true in my opinion. I have an opinion, but I'm not completely like. You know, so I'll exchange it. I'll share it with you guys. So what you think? You take a little bit back, give a little bit more. That's what this is about. You know, it, it's a bit like this, really. Whereas if I'm in my own little thing, I'm kind of again on my own. So again, you know, as a writer, there's nothing wrong with you know bouncing ideas off, sharing things. Not again, not having someone say change this, change that. That's well, silly. Just well, let, it, it's let a simple me, um... collaboration of exchange. Of well, let me be fair and then bring in Jeremy and then I think everybody's at least said something and then everybody can have a free fall about examples, mistakes, highlights. I've mentioned the master, for example, invention, um, Verity Lambert defending and keeping the Daleks, which will have changed Doctor Who history, let's be frank. Um, so everybody can have a free fall in a minute. But Jeremy, please come in. What's your, I mean, obviously we texted about this, but what's your philosophy? Share it with the, the viewers, please, on where you stand on showrunner versus producer. Uh, I'd, I'd rather have a producer rather than a showrunner. And I think, you know, as the points were made, um, but the, the, the fact was that I think the changes took place when uh, J&T took over. And although he called himself the producer, he really was kind of a bit like a showrunner. Uh, overseeing quite a lot uh, of the actual production, except for the first year when Barry Letts was the executive producer. So um, in the second year, then obviously he took over as the kind of the full producer, um, but it was very much similar to Russell T Davis in the sense that he was a kind of showrunner. But um, the definition then wasn't widely known, so he was stuck with the, the label of producer. 
but I, I, I'd rather have a producer than a showrunner. I think um, the showrunner title, I think it overtakes the program a little bit and the personality and the uh, strength yeah. of the producer who's running it marks his, uh, puts his stamp on the, the whole of the show in terms of all of the scripts and, and everything else. Uh, you've got to have a bit of diversity in terms of different writers mm. uh, to find out which writers stand out more than the others do. Um, you know, otherwise we're not going to get another Robert Holmes or another Terence Dix or Pip and Jane Baker or well, whatever. It's interesting that it's interesting that in the past you had a producer with a strong lead writer, so to speak, like Robert Holmes, like Terence Dix, like yeah. Eric Sayward. So in other words, you had that kind of overview producer knowing where the budget restraints are and what his boss is saying above, etc. And then you also had that more creative input between the two of them. You know, JMT would say, I want a trial of a time load series, that sort of thing. He would set that kind of tone and direction, but the writers would do the work underneath. That's kind of my understanding of it in a way. So, Brendan, there's a really interesting thing on this, which is that role, sort of like the, the Robert Holmes um, role, Douglas Adams, etc., is is down previously as the script editor, and there are still script editors and have been script editors for New Who, and I couldn't name one of them. Gary Russell is one of them, I think. Could well be, but I mean they they are not they are not doing it, the the role that was there previously. No, no, it's a, a very different rule. Now, Rachel, let's just so everybody can see that we're going to expand this now. Uh, so basically, Rachel, give us a couple of your mistakes or highlights of a producer versus a showrunner. Just so uh, we, we can yeah. get arguing with you while agreeing with you. <laughs> well, here, here's the thing, right? I was just going to actually, my, my two penneth that I was going to put in. Yes. Um, I've actually worked with producers and showrunners. So um, the level of control is completely different and the feeling is different as well. A, sh a showrunner, as an, as, as an actress working with a showrunner, it's, uh, everything is micromanaged, like down to the last detail, like push it out, push it out, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's incredibly controlling. Whereas on another project that I've done, I've worked with producers and um, yes, they're involved and yes, they will make suggestions to be changed, but they rely on you as the performer to, to bring it to life and do a, a great job. And they will let you know if they don't like something. And it's the, it's the job of the director to, or the, you know, the script writer to, um, you know, add to the show, so to speak, and then Obviously, producers will make changes where they see fit, but the yeah. the, le the difference in the level is 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 quite something. Which is actually, I I also think that's what affects my uh, decision of I would rather work with a producer than a showrunner. So because I've experienced both. Um, but to your original question, um, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was that again? <laughs> Some examples. I mean, um, I mean, Why while you're here? doing that, I'm going to just, uh, I'm just going to explain. Um, Michael Q. I don't know what, what he's trying to say here. Chat and Brendan. I'm better go now to another channel. I, I, I think there's no reason to go to another channel because I've seen what the other channel are saying. And after our really meaty debate, we're doing the the news, all of it. It's all there. It's just a matter of whether you want to press a button or not. I have to say, I think we have the quality panels, so I wouldn't be moving at all. Um, well put, Brendan. Can I can I ask Rachel something real quick, please? Yeah. Go on, because she's hey, going to start with um, examples. We've got to get into it. <clears throat> with, with you working uh, with both showrunners and uh, producers, have they ever been the same, where one person was filling both roles, or are they usually different? There, there, there's a significant difference. Yeah, okay. so um, like a producer would be here, there, and everywhere, whereas um, a show will be just more directly involved with what's going okay, on. Okay, have you seen it yeah. to where one person is filling both roles? Not to that extent. So it's usually two different people. Effectively, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, let, okay. so let's get, let's get into it because obviously we are competitive. So okay. in this debate, examples work, examples help, and actually makes it nice and graphic and visual to everybody. So Rachel. Mm. A pro and a con, maybe, with a showrunner or, or whatever. I know you've given me some examples. Yeah, well, my main focus, um, I think, because this is the this is the era I technically started out with, so it's the era that I know best, was be, yeah, Jonathan Nathan Turner. Um, okay, and I've got written down here, Adric, Collins Coat, getting rid of the Sonic. The Sonic was getting rid of that was one of the best things ever. You 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 know, you know that I think it's one of the worst plot devices that has ever been invented in Doctor Who. So when it <laughs> went and I saw that, you know, um uh, Colin Sylvester were not running around like zapping things and using the sonic screwdriver to I'm using my pen, but to like fix things or whatever it is they were doing with the sonic screwdriver, I was like, yes. So we get some creative writing. Oh, Cinema's got his uh, Sonic out there, you know. But, um, <laughs> you know, the the con to losing the Sonic screwdriver is um, the marketability to um, young people, uh, except maybe Sonic sun sunglasses. But well, uh, that's just another well, thing well, altogether. Before you, so before Rachel, you come to the other pieces. I know which they oh, are. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, what yeah. I'll do is I'll bring the panel in here because these are all good examples of. <laughs> so, We've got we've got a producer who decides we're going to make it a bit more kind of challenging for the writers to be more creative. So we'll get rid of in visitation part three, that very tool up there. Well, a lot of us know now that since New Who came back, the showrunners have, I personally think, excessively used various models of sonic screwdrivers to the point now where I, I just think it's a Harry Potter magic wand. So is this an example of showrunners maybe thinking of the marketing showrunners not being challenged what do people think because this is a good example because you've got a producer saying sonic screwdriver no and then you've got showrunners going no i need i need them used more i need i don't know what what's, what's well, it, 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 isn't it sort of like if you yeah, are doing lots awesome. of them if you are doing lots sorry on your goes um, this one Thank you. I was just going to say that in the 60s, you know, we, we've had this discussion for a long time, really, about you know how powerful and how you know convenient sonic screwdrivers were used, and it's uh, and, and it's always been it in some of the it's always been one of those debates, but it seems like it's got even stronger because again, even in the 60s, we saw he was the Tenant's doctor was just creating sonics uh, shields with this one and creating barriers like it was some sort of Marvel piece. Um, so, you know, at one point it was just a plot device to quickly get out of a trap door or something. Whereas now, you know, he's going all Avengers and all, you know, it's all, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's stepped up a level really, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the, that's happened because if you are doing lots of the writing and don't have time to do the plotting, then it becomes a much easier thing to go to. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why I put it out. I, I actually prefer it without the Sonic. Like when they lost it in Wild Blue Yonder to uh, repair the TARDIS, that was, I mean, Wild Blue Yonder sucked, but it it, it was <laughs> great. You you know? like it? No, I didn't like it, but... <laughs> Rachel gets blunt every now and again. <laughs> she won't say coming, also, bam! <laughs> I don't shout, but I can be blunt. But yeah, it just. Um, but when when it did go, I was I I, in, I was pleased that it wasn't used in Wild Blue Yonder. But do you know what's happening, Rachel? Is yeah. they get they get rid of the sonic screwdriver or they bring it back. They've got mm -hmm. psychic paper as well now. They've got oh, this okay. other quick accessy thing. I I in the seventy I'm a seventies Doctor Who fan, so to speak. That's where, where my formative years. And the Doctor would have to talk himself out of trouble every single time. I kind of like that bit of dialogue. Whereas now it's just psychic paper paper bang and i just think there's two if you've got the sonic doing everything psychic paper doing everything it just means you can run into an explosion faster and it turns into a hollywood movie and not doctor who yeah yep exactly like one of the, something i noticed brendan since i've started listening to big finish is 
like the ones with um, like the one I'm listening to right now called the fear monger with uh, Sylvester McCoy. He just shows up places, you know, he doesn't have a sonic screwdriver or the paper. So he has to actually come up with some BS or, or lie to get himself out of trouble. Cause the doctor's forever being in places he's not supposed to be. So you're right. It does add a whole extra element of, of him having to be even more witty to, to explain himself if he doesn't have the paper. <clears throat> Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, Rachel's got some examples. Worked, and I'm, going to try and, well. I'm going to try and stagger Rachel because to, to be fair, to bring other people in. So the overall debate is which has served best showrunner or producer. I think examples help like the sonic screwdriver one in where people have made mistakes, gone wrong, etc. cetera. Um, has, you know, um, on the top row there, um, has anyone got an example of a mistake or somebody got an example of a great highlight where it proves the producer works better than a showrunner or vice versa. As you're thinking, um, you know, I, I can't say that RTD is the only person who courts controversy, whether it's in the pronouns debate or something else, because quite frankly, JNT was very good at courting controversy by saying we might have a female doctor, remember the after Tom Baker, and then also saying I might un un unbreak the chameleon circuit. And so to get good PR, JNT would court controversy, whereas I think, in my opinion, some of the showrunners now, they create controversy in the plot. So on the top row there, time scales, Jeremy, Cinnamon, okay. any, any any examples you'd like to bring I, in time scales? I have one just really short I'll throw out. Um, regardless of it, if, if it's the job of the showrunner or the executive producer to provide some sort of a safety net to where there's not, to where uh, you can avoid redundancy, such as redundancy in the same writer, uh, something has failed, I believe, because there should be enough talent out there for there to be eight episodes of Doctor Who with eight different writers. And I don't believe that there has been a sufficient safety net where a creative team can raise that fact and, and have a little bit of control o over that um, actually happening. So as far as showrunner uh, versus the producer, the first time that I've ever thought of the fact that there probably could be some improvement in the management has been in New Who, and in particular, both RTD eras. I mean, I'm going to bring in hello, Dan Type 40. Hello, hello. I am honored. Oh, hi, to Dan. Have you on. Welcome here. I am honored to have you on our channel and you're giving us some time and support. I fully appreciate it because if, if we are going to be good at this, it's because we've watched you and let you your, your channel has grown so amazingly. We all I discovered you in lockdown. I thought you were amazing. So thank you. I'm touched that you've you've come. But your point is have to be honest, as a child, I was never that sure what the Sonic was supposed to do either. I have to say, this is interesting, isn't it? When we had producers who came and went, I think the plot ruled, the story ruled. And actually, the producer didn't, didn't necessarily impose themselves on, on, on the actual Doctor Who program. I think with the showrunners, they really do ram themselves into it. And in the Sonics case, yeah, I think I, I agree, Dan. You know, it, it, it was either used or it wasn't. I didn't quite know when or what, what for what reason. But now it's a marketing ploy. It is just a blooming marketing ploy. It's a get out because we don't want any long dialogue scenes. We just want to get to some more blooming action. It's Hollywood. Yeah, um, I said it, it's a get out of jail free card. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> No, well, no, I, I was I was coming to an end <laughs> there anyway. Jeremy, am I on the right lines here? Have you got a good example of a of a misfire or a, a brilliant masterstroke from a producer or a showrunner to prove our points? Well, a, a brilliant misfire is Russell T Davis, in the sense that he has <laughs> okay. political views. <laughs> he will go on stage and about those political views and have different views on other issues which we won't go into on here but um that would never have been allowed by the bbc back then with an in-house producer say like john dayton turner or barry letts or whatever but but with russell t davis he's a little bit of a maverick in terms of his own personal agenda and so i think wow. that's a bit of a misfire because once you start uh, explaining your own political views, where you're leaning, whether you're voting for Labour or Conservative, 
you're going to start to alienate viewers that do not follow your political persuasion, um, particularly if you're, you know, a producer. So it's better to stay neutral, and it's it's better to not really have a political view. I think uh, in this day and age, day and age, if you're a producer of a mainstream show, um, most of the producers back then didn't have a political they may have had a political view but they didn't want to share it with anybody else and and kept it to themselves and and kept in the background and that's well, the difference between the, the, uh, the producers back then in the 60s and 70s and the producer now at the moment Russell T. Davis. And, and that's what i mean I, you, I, I i we've all read that barry letts might have been a buddhist and might have put it into plans of the spiders little touches like that but i didn't know where they really stood only if i read biographies now Whereas there's there's no doubt where a showrunner stands now politically, and they've they've said it at attitude uh, award ceremonies and various places, and and then you, you and then you look at the plot, and then you look at characters that are introduced, and then you start to read it, the story in a different way, and that's what disappoints me all the time about this, which is we know too much about where RTD especially stands. Um, and then you read into certain characters and certain moments, and certain moments get people angry and irritated. And it, you just start to think, what, where where are we going with this? Um, I mean, you know, I've got examples which I can show you. For example, I, I, RTD seems to be a, a real obsession at the moment. I know a lot of people are worried about so many things. Um, now, if I could, I'll bring it up in a moment. It's not quite there yet, but I'll, I'll bring it up in a moment. But um, you know the start the pronouns debate but actually his davros gate what he said in unleashed uh what he says at various ceremonies it, it is very concerning when you see it then transferred onto screen because then you think as you say jeremy it is only one standpoint that we're ever going to get there's no challenge to it they all seem to be in an echo chamber of saying in this case tori's out this that that you know um whereas i never knew that jnt was the closest to RTD in some ways, the big showman. But I don't, I didn't really know where the hell he was going with politics. Just didn't know. Um, can I, can I, I see one, uh, something positive for um, Russell Davis as a showrunner? It goes back to um, his first stint, which is, I yeah. think, the choice to make it slightly more soapy in the sense of introducing family for the companion was a good decision in terms of, of making it feel more real to people that were watching it then. And I think we'd moved away from um, being able to just have people appearing from nowhere and then disappearing and having no connection anywhere. So I think, I think so if I, in, in, but that's not, that's not an agenda for the programme that makes it difficult to write a story, because you can write any story and still have that. It, it's just something that makes the story slightly wider and slightly more um, complex for what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the examples I was going to obviously uh, show, and I might as well get out there because we're not going to go into certain other things that have been out on the news, but what we will look at is what actually has been said by RTD. So here's an example of our showrunner, and I cannot think of Verity Lambert, John Wiles, Innes Lloyd, I could go on, doing any sort of kind of discussion. Admittedly, they never had unleashed and confidentials then, but however, so... On one side, in, in the yellow there, that's when Yasmin Finney is talking about the Star Beast. And in the blue is, is Russell Davies's comments. And this is all about, as you know, the trans character, etc., etc. And so, fair enough, Yasmin Finney is quite happy to see this representation. And as she says, it will be a completely different story, I think. Um, if we haven't seen Rose growing up, I think representation is what we need and what the younger generation needs to feel like they can do it too. So there you get a trans actor talking about playing a trans character in 2023 then. Then you get the showrunner, who's a public servant, um, that Rose contains the he and the she and the neither and the both, and that's a new future. Rose goes beyond words, beyond definitions, and it is important, I think, that visibility thing I've said before, like as you were saying, if you grow up seeing this stuff, homophobia and transphobia happens when it's something you've never seen before, you can temper that reaction and change it. And he just goes on a little bit more. 
Um, if you introduce these images to people happily and normally and calmly when they're young, then it just becomes normal. It is normal. I don't need to say it's normal, but that's normality it just becomes part of your world. You're not stressed. You don't freak. You don't react. It's a better world. Um, th that was unleashed, really transcribed. Now, I have never heard any other producer talk in that much detail about anything political or societal like that. Am I wrong? Okay. I'm trying to think. I am None trying that to I was think. ever aware of. <clears throat> no. Hey, no. Everybody, uh, everybody, check your mics. Make sure you don't have a fan. Somebody's got a fan yep. or something's blowing on a microphone. We can hear it. I don't, I don't want to run off anybody that gets. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, you sure. know, there's, an, there's an example I, of him going quite strong. Go on, Hugh. <clears throat> so I, I, I don't think, think of anyone saying that. But again, go back to the conversations we've had before about Verity Lambert. I, I think Verity Lambert was um, central to Barbara being the type of character that she was. And that was about normalising a, a woman being sort of like a strong character and, and, and being able to take a lead and not just screaming. And I think, you, so I think there's a lot that can be done if you want to do that. But I think it's this, there's something about the tying together of the statements. So whenever you were talking about um, John Nathan Turner being controversial and getting and, and, and being an early version of clickbait, I think that that might make sense if Russell was the producer but not the showrunner. Hey, hey, Brendan, I just wanted to say something to Hugh real quick, because, uh, Hugh, you're the first person I've heard talk about Verity Lambert much. And so I know you talked about all the involvement she had with Barbara, but I'd never seen a picture of her until Brendan showed one at the beginning of the stream. Right. And as soon as I saw it, I thought about the things you said and I was like, oh, Barbara's <laughs> like her avatar. Barbara was like an avatar for her. That was the, the yeah. impression I got. Just yeah. when I, once I finally saw the picture, I put it together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I mean. And, and, and look, um, you have to be a strong person to be a producer or a showrunner. It's just that there were breaks and constraints. It's a bit like the president of America has, you know, Congress, the Senate, there's, there's you know, there's the balance of power, they call it. And of course, when you had a BBC producer, you had departmental heads above you. We all know Michael Grade. We all know Jonathan Powell. We all know how they intervened. We all know how Philip Kinchcliffe suddenly regenerates into Graham Williams and the humour had to come in because somebody high up got frightened of Mary Whitehouse and suddenly all the horror goes and it's all comedy, comedy, Doctor Who. We all know that. But RTD, Stephen Moffat, have really injected an awful lot into the show. So I find it very interesting how... I, you can see where I'm going, folks, in the thread. I really do feel as though the excess outweighs the benefits here. Cinnamon, you wanted to say something, I think, and then Rachel. I think it. I think it improves in certain situations, certain contexts as well. I think it improves the quality of the scripts as well. When we talk about showrunners and producers, I mean, look at Moffat. I mean, he was showrunner of Doctor Two, and then Sherlock at the same time. So if it, if, it, if it wasn't already a, a lot of pressure on Doctor Who, then you know you, you doubled the pressure. You know, worrying about a whole different show. And then that was when, you know, and we talk about, you know, as much as the quality was amazing, Doctor, the scripts weren't always the best. You know, you get some good gems, like the Mummy on, on the, you know, the train and the Mummy on the Orient Express, you know, but like a lot of those uh, seasons, a lot of those, you know, they were a bit, a little bit samey. And, you know, and there was always that discussion, wasn't it, oh, Doctor Who's coming a little, bit, a little bit like Doctor Who. Whereas, again, if we had a producer, I don't think that would have happened. And again, there was less constraint, there was less pressure. Um, I feel like what the to maybe if you know if I had a, my my car <laughs> to, to, to two wheel two wheel it'd be a bike or whatever you know I, I get that but you know it's if we, if, there, if, there, if there was a producer at that point in time then we wouldn't have had the perhaps the issues or all, all the, all Let's the have story a that on. if we had a producer but it'd be better you know well that's why we're looking at examples because examples hopefully enlighten us now rachel what were you going to say um yeah so it's just going back to what you were talking about um 
with uh, what Russell and um, Yasmin were saying yeah. on yeah. on the Star Beast. Um, it's, I think a lot of uh, this sort of thing also um, it, it gets like power housed by social media and the news. It becomes like it becomes talking points. I've often said. It, particularly in some of my videos that the golden age of the movie star and the producer you know back 50 60 70 years ago is 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 dead because there's no longer any boundaries and no longer any mystery surrounding that person so they can now go and say what they like and they utilize that and they utilize it in their work as well so that's all i was going to say Do you know it's a bit like the royal family when the queen the late queen used to say you know you never complain never explain mm, and there's yeah. an element where you create a mystery like the hollywood stars you're talking about and now because we know so much about what makes each writer on the bbc crew tick or why they've been selected you're reading into it and actually if it's not your politics you really do feel a little bit more challenged and just like somebody i think melanie was saying in the thread you know it, it, it is it getting to that point if you don't like where rtd is going with it it's not your show anymore as in you know it's kind of it's hard isn't it because the, it's he's the immovable object really um and yeah, it's I a shame also, because with, sorry, thing well. just, with all the producers you never got that because, feeling you know you know you might see jane teen his hawaiian shirt and all the rest of it and that he was a bit more famous but um and flamboyant but jnt still made sure he well he just made sure the program still existed and was out there um that there's a lot of places we can go with this and, and i just want to throw one or two up there to get you all thinking but you for example am i blaming too much the showrunner versus the producer the bbc itself has imposed itself on this doctor who program many many times when the producers had no choice um you know <laughs> So sometimes when we're looking at how producers' mistakes or, or credits, it has to go higher too with that kind of discussion. It's a really difficult one, this, and I think the only way we can really navigate through this is via one or two of the examples and actually really look at how they've been played. So does anyone want to share one? I mean, I've got, for example, um, well, you know, because I'm, 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 I'm trying to fill in gaps if nobody's got one. Um, but basically, uh, let's have a look. Last one on RTD, because it's just the present story. Davros, as you know, is the last one. Now, we know the story. I'm not going to go over Davros Gate again. I'm not. So in the thread, don't worry. We've done shows on it. Every other stream's done it. I'm not going to do that. But this is what he said in Unleashed. And I wanted to just discuss whether we think this is the role of the showrunner going too far, or is this acceptable? So basically, as you know, um, time and society and culture and taste has moved on and there's a problem with the Davros of old and that he's a wheelchair user who's evil and I had problems with that and a lot of us on the production team had problems with that <clears throat> uh, of associating disability with even and trust me there's a very long tradition of this um, <clears throat> excuse me I'm not blaming people in the past at all but the world changes and when the world changes Doctor Who has to change as well so we made the choice to bring back Davros without the facial scarring and without the wheelchair support unit I say this is how we see Davros now this is what he looks like this is 2023 this is our lens and Davros used to look like that and he looks like this now and that we are absolutely standing by now you know there's no compromise at all. Okay, he's the showrunner, he runs everything, he's a supremo. A producer would have to argue that point with the head of drama. And actually, because Davos is such an iconic character, it might have had to have gone to the head of BBC One, possibly. Now, I, I will it's say funny, this, isn't it? the I, I will, I will say this and I'll shut up, right? I'll say this and then I'll shut up on the Davros one. It's just an example. But basically, on the Davros point, if... I would actually say, if show, if the showrunner says the Davos character is problematic now in 2023, I would say, rather than compromise, mate, because he's having his cake and eating it, he's saying, I really love the Davos character, but I don't like how he looks. Well, I'm sorry, you can't have one or the other. So basically, park and retire the character. Sense. Be brave enough to do that as a showrunner, rather than, you know... Now, I, I know a lot of people want to come in, but if I'll let people come in on this example first, and then I will go to Brandon. Rachel? Okay, so with the with Davros Gate, um, 
the fact that he drew attention to it was what made it problematic. It was never yeah. problematic to begin with. Okay. The fact that he went and said all of that, yeah. that made it pro problematic. And then they, he introduced, as uh, so he gets rid of the um, the life support system, brings in a, a new wheelchair user in a good role. Um, well, I say a, a good role, you know, it depends what your perception of good and evil is. Um, and essentially he gimmicks her wheelchair immediately and blasts, and it's, yeah, I say it's cool, but it blasts off rockets and essentially turns it immediately into, in my opinion, a stereotype, a bit of a gimmick, a bit of a tool. And that's, that wasn't fair. So it only becomes problematic if you draw an attention to it. And he, he drew attention to Davos and immediately to Shirley by turning her wheelchair into a weapon. I mean, I mean, this this is my issue, and and so Darko, yeah, we're not debating the disability thing this time. It's been done. The, as he says, there's a part of me that gets what RTD is trying to do, and fine, we, we might agree with it or disagree with it. That's not my discussion tonight. My discussion is the idea that um, <clears throat> if that's his final decision as showrunner, he says it's that's final. There's nobody else to challenge that. There's nobody else to say, hold on, this is an iconic Doctor Who character. Exactly. And, and yes, you really feel like that's your issue, um, RTD. However, we as the BBC want Doctor Who to look like Doctor Who, and we want Davos to stay the same. But it looks as though that does not get a look in anymore. And that's when I get concerned about the role of showrunner versus the role of producer. And because he's, yeah, he's bothered about the, 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 the marketing and that. Brandon, you were going to come in. Oh, I just had one quick thing to say. Um, one of the ones I noticed was like, I mean, look at Moffat when he took over from RTD's first run. You know, I told you and Rachel yesterday that I'd recently, like within a space of a couple of days, I like binge watched season 10, right? Like I'm on the hunt for where this all went wrong. And uh, I noticed like, like there wasn't anybody to kind of tap. There must not have been anybody to tap uh, Moffat on the shoulder and say, hey, pal back up a little bit you know you, you don't need to tell them bill's gay every episode <laughs> they know they saw you know what i'm saying just little things you saw them doing and like little jabs and stuff is like you could see there that there needed to be um i mean that's just one of probably uh, many cases where somebody need to put a hand on their shoulder and say whoa 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 back up a little bit yeah because i think the doctor who was successful in the end because actually they had budgetary constraints and various other constraints and in the end you had to really think carefully and do amazing experimentation with cso and lots of other things and so of course when when you've got somebody who's got no brakes on them and a big budget you then really go in such a completely different direction to where you you could have been with challenge and you know breaks on it i really do think if you don't like the davos character and you're a doctor who showrunner um you need to make a decision you either stick with the character which everybody recognizes or you think it's not good for this generation and it, he's just retired it's as simple as that you can't have both you don't um, have to use them you don't have they, no. there's no gun to their head that they have to use a villain if they can come up with other ones that'll entertain us you know Oh, yes, but it's cheap, it's cheap to say I want to use the Davos name that somebody else created. And oh I'm, yeah, I'm, yes, but I'm, I'm not. Yeah, uh, go on, Jeremy. But you said, but you see, Russell T. Davis want, has a need to change the character. He has to be seen to change the character. He has to be seen to change everything, and this is why this is it brings it back to political correctness and wokeness, and that's that's what he's doing. He's he's championing that cause. And and that's why he's made all the changes in this in this particular reiteration. But I'm fascinated. I mean, just with this example, and then tell me to shut up. But with this one example, for example, the same showrunner used Davros before and brought him back and thought in his wheelchair, in his life support oh, machine, how he was you vital. To do yeah. So what's happened in the intervening? Time? I'm not. I'm not aware of a cultural revolution. Actually, I'm not aware of any major. Hey, was, was that a pun? Like the revolution of wheelchair <laughs> wheels? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and I'm thinking, gosh, the same person, the same showrunner now thinks that something he brought back in season four suddenly wants the opposite. It was, Incredible. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a problem for this producer, yeah. Davros. So no. I have a problem with it either. 
No, and, and so anyway, so there's my example of where showrunner goes too far. Um, I now, agree um, with I, I agree with everyone on the panel, but I really do have to to put this in um, that I believe with Davros, Russell T Davies may have actually gotten it right, and I know that that's uh, not a popular opinion. But when I saw the Davros change, I thought that someone was making a joke on Twitter because I had never considered Davros to be in a wheelchair. So what I did is I contacted uh, Galen Lay, Broadway music composer and a famous and highly respected public disability rights advocate and public speaker for disability access in the performing arts. She is a long term wheelchair user. And she said that she did see Davros to be problematic because um, as a long-term wheelchair user, she did see Davros as being disabled and she believed it was for the better. So I will take her opinion as a famous public disability rights speaker and advocate and um, then uh, go, go to you, Rachel. Rachel, I also agree with you completely that one of the huge problems in it was calling attention to it. Yeah. Um, just to well, counter that, it's interesting that um, the the lady that, you know, um, said that yeah, yeah. because um, my one of my best friends, he's a wheelchair user. And when I told him what um, Russell T. Davis said, he told me to F off. He thought it was hilarious that Russell really? T. Davis fought like that. Because British. Like, yeah, yeah, I know, right, straight to the point. You know, you think I'm blunt? <laughs> um, no, but, yeah, he thought the completely completely the opposite. So I just found that interesting, that's all. Well, and it also, it also this supports the, this, this overall question, do, do the executive producers and the showrunners have too much control? Maybe it wasn't the right but decision. That, but that's, How that's many my point. people were on it, the it, team it, and who could stop something like that from happening if it was actually if, wrong? If he ends up being the on the right have the final say? But yeah. this is the point. I didn't want to get into the Davros debate per se. I wanted to say the actual issue was in this case, um, yes, serendipity might be, he might be on the right side of history. That's, that's you know, he might be just lucky this time round. You never know. That's not my point. My point is it's quite clear nobody's challenged him. It's just so I, 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 I think there's, there's a, a, a separate thing here, which I, I mentioned before on this, which is I think if you have a character that is perceived as disabled, it is wrong generally to have that as an able-bodied actor. And that then causes the problem more, I think, than having the character of Davros, but having an actor who isn't um, disabled and who isn't in a wheelchair now, I think, is harder. Yeah. Go on, Cinnamon. You wanted to come in. Yeah, to make it worse. Sorry, I just, uh, I'm quite passionate about this because I've spoken this before. And again, you know, I, I listen to time skills and you know, I, I understand his viewpoint. I, I even respect it. You know, it's, it's an opinion. We're all allowed one. Um, but again, I would say though that typically activists will have an agenda, so it's natural that someone would, would have an issue with that. Um, again, as someone with a hidden disability, as a disabled person, um, not physically, but again, you know, disabled nonetheless, uh, you know, who are these people? Well, we had a, this production team, we had such a, are you disabled, Russell? You know, again, this, this speaking on behalf of people, because, you know, for every one person in a wheelchair who said, oh, no. It was so terrible. It was. It needed to change. You could. I could find you three more people who hated it. I've spoken to Daniel. He was absolutely in tears about it. No one has ever really sat down and looked at Davros and thought, mm, "Do you know what? Yeah, what a terrible character. This needs to change." Because everyone looked at. Because you know, I look at Davros and you know, everyone in a wheelchair is evil, aren't they? Because yeah, because, because that's that's totally ridiculous. I mean, it's never seriously. I mean, yeah, the odd person on Twitter who likes to live on there, yes, maybe. But, you know, I get so passionate about this because I find see, it so ridiculous. We see, this is, this um, is, this sorry, is ben, it. I and I, I, about yeah, that, yeah, but... I, I'm trying not to, as I said, I'm trying not to go down the Davros debate, debate again because I know where everybody stands. We all do. I think nobody in fandom is sitting on the fence on this one. But it proves a point that, oh, my God, almost one of the most famous, iconic characters in Doctor Who history is fundamentally changed without challenge at all. Because he actually says there's been no challenge. We all agree. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, the whole production staff. Mind you, remember, as I said, the showrunner is the creative supremo, uh, so he actually trumps them. But basically, he 
and the whole echo chamber of Bad Wolf and maybe Disney said, go for it. Now, I, I, I can't imagine any Doctor Who fan looking at the history of Doctor Who. I think they'd rather see Davros parked than actually fundamentally change him. But that's just an example. Yeah, because that, again, um, simple thing. If you didn't like it, just rest it. It's that hard. It, it's, it's really common and simple. Like, if you do, if you have some problem with it, all of a sudden now, just rest it to say, no, we're not going to bring it back, whatever. But again, no, again, my partner is profoundly deaf and we watched the series nine two-parter with, with a deaf character, you know, and, and she, you know, she liked that. The problem is there's nothing wrong with representation. Of course, you can have representation. There's nothing wrong with having stories that have a deaf character or even a trans character. The difference is where do you need it? Well, it's nice to have it. Again, I, I would be nice if there, was, if there was an autistic character on the show. It would be nice, as long as it was done well, of course. Um, but I don't need it to happen. I don't need to see an autistic person you on see, the show because it's not what it's about. It's see, and I'll let, and I'll, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll let Rachel have the last point on this Davros thing. And then we, well, when I say we'll move on, we're still on the same debate, but we, we'll get off this example. But <laughs> go on, Rachel, you, you, you finalise it for us on Davros. <laughs> I'm muted. That was about to start talking. Yeah. Um. So, all right. So the thing about this whole situation, when you're looking at, just like uh, this being problematic and things like that. But uh, what I'm going to say is probably going to sound really bad. Um, but it's not always possible to have a disabled actor, a physically disabled actor. And that could be due to health and safety, due to insurance. Um, but wherever possible, they should actually be in that role. That doesn't mean to say, obviously, you need to discontinue a character for what you know for whatever for whatever reason and um the the thing about working at the bbc or being in any show is nowadays these deis they, they call for that representation and that representation is required to be there uh, it doesn't it, it can be in any way shape or form but it is it is a requirement now and so, what okay. is a dei rachel uh it is well. I don't really know what it stands stands for, but it's diversity, it's a, equity, and it, inclusion. Yeah, inclusion. Yeah, I say the DEI, and I can think what off the top of my head what it's it was. A, it's a form. Diversity, that's equity, equity. Equity. You know what, I just want to inclusion. Now, just to just to pull back, and remember, examples really help here. And in the thread, please give us examples of where you think showrunners have really nailed it. Masterstroke mistakes. Or have there been more mistakes or more highlights under producers? Now, let me just remind everybody where we stand with Doctor Who. There haven't been that many producers, you know. If you look at that list there, you've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine producers in the history of oh, Doctor wow. Who. And then we had three showrunners. Now, out of all of those, the producer who was, was there for the longest was John Nathan Turner, followed by Barry Letts. Barry Letts came back to kind of oversee as well, didn't he? Um, and, of course, the, the, the one who runs ahead of everything really on episodes is Stephen Moffat there, uh, actually. Uh, although I, I think that's, yeah, there's a bit more to add. Right. But what I'd say, here's my question, when you compare all the producers and all the showrunners there, is... Um, it seems to me, just to me, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to provoke, but I think under three showrunners, the show has been fundamentally changed, radically changed by so many things. Timeless children, fugitive doctors, war doctors, time war. This could be good or bad. but the River amount song. Of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The amount of changes in Doctor Who under three people compared to those others is, I think, showing you that these people have excessive power and sometimes I think they're changing the programme from something that it actually was. That's I, me being... I, I, Brent, I think one of the things is it's not just about power. It's if you put that list of um, producers up, leaving, leaving aside... The, those of us who are geeks and who know some of them, and, and some of them might be known in Verity for obvious reasons, John Nathan Turner perhaps for obvious reasons, um, but even someone like Philip Hinchliffe, who I think is incredibly important, or Barry Letts, 
if you go outside of fandom, no one has heard of them. No one. Whereas this, what we now have is Russell Davis's Doctor Who, Stephen Moffat's Doctor Who, Chris Chibnall's Doctor Who, because people hear of them because they do do the publicity. And say, I, 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 people know that now, but uh, then, no, it wasn't, it wasn't the face of Doctor Who, which the showrunner is. Thanks. Does anyone want to come in with another example? I've dominated this and I do apologise. I just want to provoke, provoke, provoke and get that debate really fired up. You've got 60 years to work with. I've mentioned the Master, the Daleks, Innes Lloyd brought the Cybermen in Denth Planet. These producers were thinking, right, we've got the Daleks, we need something else. Innes Lloyd, was it? Oh, yeah, it was Innes Lloyd with the regeneration, the first ever regeneration. These producers really did do certain amazing things with Doctor Who. The master uh, introduction. Um, now, I've got to be fair, The Weeping Angels is a great addition by uh, Stephen Moffat, for example. But, you know, where can we go on highlights and mistakes? I'm, I'm sure, as Doctor Who fans, you've got Lord Cinnamon. And then after that, I'll go to well, Rachel, because I know actually. you've got another one. The last one was a good introduction. Um, I was watching uh, one of the documentaries i was just checking out the series 15 is it? yeah 15 blue that release i was just checking out the feed um and there was a good documentary about um uh oh god what was his name i'm having a moment here um the script it was the writer for you know who wrote the war games <laughs> i can't be wrong. um malcolm hulk anyone know malcolm hulk yeah. terence sticks yeah. no yeah yeah, yeah. terence I can't believe I forgot well, that. You God carry on. The thread will tell us. Don't worry. Good documentary. Yeah. Terrence sat there talking with Baradex and him and Baradex, they were discussing, again, they were having this discussion as well. That's probably why I remember it now. But they were, and they were talking about, you know, because I think he was a script editor for a while, and they were talking about, again, they would have discussions, him, Terrence Dix, and Baradex about what they would do and, you know, what they would change and, you know, he was talking about it. His Terence Dix was speaking about his role as a script editor, and you know he, that you wouldn't always necessarily change things. Or, you know, there was a really good discussion. And they were basically discussing this very topic. And again, you know, it was basically uh, the benefits of that. I just believe, you know, again, even though I I grew up in a time where I've, I've always known a show, but I do believe there's absolutely benefits to people. And under that, that of course, you can have occasional disagreement. You can have, you know, situations like J and T and Eric Sayward where you know partnerships can, you know, fault a little bit, and you know there is disagreements. But on the whole, then go anyway. You've got a good core, you know, a good core unit of people. You know, you can and, and look at the situations like, you know, I, I just just a name off the top of my head. You know, the, the issue where, of course, we had a writer commissioned, Robert Hall. For Unfortunately, he passed away before he could compart. Um, you know, if that was a showrunner, and that would of course lead to chaos, wouldn't it? You know, how you know production crew and getting cancelled or whatever. I know that's quite an extreme case, obviously. Um, but you know, the the, the, the the positive of that that there are you know ways around that. You know, well, having see, someone who's in charge of the show, like, the publicity of it and stuff, and then commissioning a writer. I, just, I think it, it improves the quality well, of the, well, the story well, as well. Like I said, with Moffat. Well, yeah, I'm, 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 and, and honestly, examples really score here because we can all kind of you know, tear them apart. So, for example, when we're looking at producers, uh, if I'm if I'm steering my conversation and my own judgment to say producers overall were a bit more beneficial for Doctor Who, you with each one you can say with J and T you had something like Kings of Androzani that was a big benefit he he decided the right director for the right thing which a showrunner does as well but he wanted um a certain way of doing it he wanted a certain style and you've got that but the one story later you've got the twin dilemma so you go from one thing to another so you think well okay then cave of Dr and design is a big hit under jnt twin dilemma is a big miss under jnt you've got somebody like um peter bryant Okay, in the 60s, Web of Fear, but then you've got the Dominators. You've got somebody like Derek Sherwin, who sadly, in a way, now some, now this is where the threads will kick off <laughs> either way. 
in that first season of John Pertree, he was the one. Who, uh -huh. He was the one who set up those four seven parters, right? You know that was an interesting one. You know, um, so you, again, the BBC sometimes, with their neglect of Doctor Who, have let the producers run the show. <laughs> so while we say the showrunners, and, and I know Hugh says it's not necessarily about power, but. Um, Sometimes the the BBC couldn't give a damn about Doctor Who, and in the end, JNT was just keeping their blooming thin afloat. And there were parts in the late sixties when really Peter Bryant and Derek Sherwin and then Barry Letts were really allowed to do what they wanted to do because basically the BBC had lost interest. You know, there's that kind of element too to this. Well, even um, Richard, wasn't it? They did that in 2005, where. Rachel, you know you had an example, another example, because examples score well here, helps the everybody. Um, so another one of a good or a bad. Well, um, okay. So one is not bad, but it's not it's not great. It's it's good. It's it's, it's kind of middling. Um, and the other one, well, it's just bad. Uh, so I'll start with this one. Okay, um, and that's Colin's coat. Right, and, now, I just want to be clear here, right? Colin is my favorite doctor, but that coat was terrible. He didn't want to wear it, right? He didn't want to wear he it. He wanted to no. dress more like Eccleston did, I think he said. I, I think that's what he said. You're absolutely right. But um, now... There it is on screen, bright and colourful. I, I admit I do want that as, as a cosplay costume. I'm not going to deny that. Um, but he, he did customise it himself with a little cat brooch and he changed those on a regular basis. But um, th this is what I feel like with this one, um, particularly because it became it came off the back of, of um, the case of Androzani, which was a brilliant story. What I feel like is because I said in the last show that Peter Davison's doctor is more humane. He's a little bit more arrogant, a lot more calmer. And I think what JNT wanted was a bit erratic in his decision. He wanted the complete opposite. Now, he knew that Colin was going to give that to him acting wise because Colin, I think, is much more like the earlier doctors, in my opinion, particularly Patrick Troughton. Um, in many respects, but he also wanted to do that through the costume. And um, I believe the costume designer thought that was a joke. Uh, yeah, he does wear it well. I do agree. He does wear it well. It's a brilliant cut on him. But the, co um, the costume designer thought it was a joke. So, so she, she brings it to uh, Jonathan Nathan Turner and he gives it this stamp of approval and is like, what were you thinking? And so... There is a is there is a line. I've got it on a t-shirt. I'm a walking work of art. I've actually got that on a t-shirt with the picture of Colin's coat on it. But um he just picked it up and he and he wore it. But to be honest with you, with a loud and quite brash doctor, do you really need that kind of coat? Now on this, Rachel, I'm gonna say <laughs> let's go to it because sometimes it's great to dovetail with a thread. Hello, JWC reviews. I know you're on earlier, don't worry. Speaking of courts, JNT's insistence that the Doctor have a designated costume from Davison onwards, and that question mark collar with Tom Baker onwards, is an example of the producer interfering. And I agree with you there. I can't always hit on the showrunners because I hated that. Yeah. And it's interesting now that you hear other, or maybe the same Doctor Who fans, going mad about the shooty Doctor having so many different uh, costumes to the point where he doesn't have a recognisable silhouette. So which is it? Are we just contrary fans? Are we really having a problem with, as JWC Review says, and I agree with him, that basically, I mean, the cricket outfit also was a little bit more of a cosplay when you really look at it. Yeah. It was a standout. And the celery, what the hell was a celery? When you look well, at the question mark, when you look at Sylvester McCoy's question mark umbrella, I know John Yield and you love it, but hello, come on! It started to take the mick out of the program. And strangely then... enough, sorry, Brendan, to cut no, no. off. I wrote down the stick of celery because that was contested actually by Peter Davison, and he the he said, "I will wear the stick of celery so long as you can explain what it's for." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And we had to wait till Caves of Androzani. <laughs> yeah. Last, last it took minute. a while. Yeah, yeah last minute. Just took a while. 
But um, um, yeah. well, since Rachel has raised Colin's costume, but it looks as though JWC reviews and myself can raise other ones. And then if we come to 2024, the 15th Doctor's been in a kilt, in a nightclub, in just a tight white top. He's wearing a leather jacket, blah, blah, blah. Which is it? What do we want? Do we do we think the showrunner's got it right, that he needs to be a bit more authentic nowadays and changeable? Um, or do we need to risk going down this marketing road as j t did? What I'm wondering if this could possibly be for marketing of action figures, because yeah. um, I'm still waiting for the shooty got action figure in just his underwear. <laughs> now, <laughs> imagine if there was a new shooty got action figure in each it? of his costumes. Well, you know, <laughs> Doctor Who fans have shelves, and I can just imagine a shelf lined up with all of the shooty got well, uh, action figures in each different costume. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'll do as going to do one. <laughs> I don't think yeah. I'll produce one. <laughs> I don't think he's got plans for that. Yeah. I mean, how would, uh, yeah. Now, uh, so I've asked you about costume. Nobody's biting at the moment on that one. What about uh, if I said then? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. It's well, tradition, man. I, I would keep it. Sorry. I was actually thinking about what everybody was saying. Okay. Let me say, I'll just say real quick. I wouldn't mess with that. I understand like doing small variations, kind of like Tom Baker did, maybe a different hat, different jacket, little things like that. But I think it's good, especially for young people and kids to make that image a lot more iconic and, and recognizable. So they should more or less look fairly similar unless they're in a special situation or like a big gala or something need to wear a tux. But overall, yeah. I think it's very important to the way they, at least up until now that they portray the doctor and they need to keep doing that in my opinion. Right, now before we just uh, kind of bring the, the debates to a, a, a certain point, um, I just want to remind people that obviously we've, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a lot of our um, panelists might be saving their, their, their fire for some of these items. We are, yes, we're going to be looking at these tonight. You can see them there. So stay with us. We are going to be doing that. But I've got my question from a panel now. Since we're talking about um, producer versus showrunner, who actually was the best custodian of Doctor Who over Ooh. the 60 years? You're going to start a fight. Ooh. I mean, who did it? Cinnamon wants to start. And don't worry, we'll, we will get back to um, Rachel with your example. But go on, Cinnamon. Who actually, in the end, either by accident or fluke or whatever, was the best custodian of Doctor Who? And was it a producer? Was it a showrunner? I think it's got to be, for me, I would say j &T. Uh, And, you know, yes, he tried to leave at certain points, but, you know, and the, the back, you know, kind of coerced staying a bit longer, you know, he's like, oh, begrudgingly, you know, he spent a lot of his time on that. And, and, and do you know what? For the mistakes, yeah, I mean, we can look at the things like pretentious question marks and stuff like that, all the silly things of that era, and all the things at the time that fans are frustrated about. But I think end of the day from what was it producer all this you know back in all this other which jobs he's done on the show throughout the years he spent a lot of his life on this show really you know when we talk about service and stuff like that, that's a lot he spent a, he dedicated a lot of his time um to, to the show. as fans you know we have our moments and sometimes we do take it a bit far within reason and you know and you know he, he did a lot and you know and he, he always tried his best and you make to make it bigger and make it better and to make it fit into the 80s didn't he um and it's just a shame that you know that it would always get something for him after he left the show and it, it never really happened and he kind of and it didn't well, really see, get much better from after that so it, it's unfortunate how well as we go around the panel i mean on the jnt score i have to say i think it's quite clear that there was a point when he was trying to get out and i think fair enough for everybody's career he was trying to get out but but actually, because the BBC was so disinterested in Doctor Who, if he left, the show was over. So bless him, in many ways, he, yeah. he kept it, it going to up to 89. <laughs> the other thing is, I was at the 1983 convention, uh, the Lonely One, and he got the Americans involved. He had conventions in Chicago. I mean, whether we call him showman or whatever, he was trying desperately to keep this program going. So he was a bigger, larger than life producer, and he really did try and make Doctor Who go. He was global. ahead of his time as well, mostly, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where does anyone else want to go with the who was the best custodian of Doctor Who 
I, I would I would would say John Nathan Turner, funny enough, um, because I think he, at the end of the day he had a kind of symbiotic relationship with with the show. Um, you know whether that was the right sort of relationship or not as producer. Um, I don't know whether he should have been dis, dis, distant from the show. You know, separate. But um, I think he did care for the show yeah. quite a lot. And I think it does show in terms of him going abroad and producing, uh, promoting it. And um, I think I think that shows over the years. However, again, I think he stayed too long. I think he got typecast as a science fiction, you know, Doctor Who producer. And I think, um, I think he should have he should have left a few years earlier. I think this is the problem that when the BBC got neglectful of Doctor Who, yeah. you had to hope that there was somebody who actually was putting it first. He certainly didn't put his career first. Um, Brandon, where would you go on, on your decision? Ooh, um, it's hard, but like if I started to narrow it down, it'd be between um, Terence Dix, JNT, maybe maybe Hinchcliffe. Uh, it, for me, it's between JNT or Terrence Brooks. I mean, just personally for me, as far as talking about the things that I like a lot, you know what I mean? Because we each like a little bit of something. Some a lot, we like a lot of the same things about Doctor Who, but each of us has our own little niche thing that we like about it that's different than the others. Like me and John are partial. We like the seventh doctor and stuff. You know what I mean? Or like 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 that whole era. So J and T for me, probably because he gave quite a bit of himself to keep it going. So so he's he's definitely deserves recognition for that. And you know what? He started the 45 minute uh, format. Uh, in, didn't he? Hey, I mean, look, Michael Jordan, he, he was the greatest basketball player of all time, but he didn't come out and win every game. He tried to win every game. So I think, you know, I think JNT, JNT was trying to get slam dunks and three pointers, but you know, you can't win every game. And that's definitely one of the worst ones he lost because I, I hate that format now I, that I've watched classic. Who. It was JNT who actually, formatted the repeats into the five faces of Doctor Who. Everybody of a certain age, that was a masterstroke. This mm. man loved the program so much, he was fighting it to get it on BBC Two. He was fighting to, to get new fans in. RTD will make an argument about getting Generation Z and it's not for any of us anymore. Okay, whatever. JNT was trying to win new fans who didn't know there was a doctor before Tom Baker in the five faces of Doctor Who. That was a masterstroke. I, I have to say, I'm surprised at myself at the moment, but in the end, JNT, <laughs> he did do an awful lot. He was around for a long time, but he did do an awful lot, and I could see the passion behind it. Rachel, what would you like to say? Hmm? Um... Uh but, oh gosh, uh, what my, my producers? Oh, it would be between Verity Lambert and J and T, because Verity had the responsibility of introducing everything and getting people involved and getting people to sit down, bums on seats, and watching it. And that that is a difficult thing to do. <laughs> that wouldn't be easy to do. And JNT, because he kept it going. Oh, yes. And this one. Thank you. <laughs> you reminded me. Yeah, the, you're going to praise that the JNT was really good at casting. That's what you're going to do, isn't it? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm not going to praise that as, as per se. Now, <sighs> I don't like criticizing actors. So I'm not going to yeah. um, yeah. criticize because uh, I'm an I'm an actor. I know exactly how he feels. I mean, this is Earth Shock, so. But uh, he's about to feel pretty damn bad. He's about to feel pretty <laughs> damn bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was literally thinking it. I don't know if I should say. No, no. I was actually watching Full Circle today, um, in preparation just to see if my um, my opinion is it was it the acting, was it the choice of actor, or was it the fact that he was a bit half-hearted and couldn't be bothered to continue on with um, with uh, with Adric's actual proper characterization, and that that's nothing to do with Matthew Waterhouse. That's purely to do with the fact that um, I actually think JNT started out really strong with the introduction of Adric, and 
sort of gave up on the character and he was on to the next idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I've written down here, Matthew Waterhouse, it's not his fault. He's He was very much a newbie actor. And newbie actors are generally in need of something to grab onto so they've got something to refer to in order to help them maintain the character portrayal. And he was always described as the artful dodger type of character. And in full circle, he definitely had that. And I would say he carries it off as a newbie actor pretty well. I will say that. Now, I do think that the actor who plays his brother would have been better as Adric. Yeah. But at the mm -hmm. same time, you can't, I, I can't, um, like fault him for what he was trying to do. You could see he was trying, mm. and he offered the friction. He put the friction there, and he was reacting exactly how it how it should be. But then, in other stories, they just focused on his mathematical genius. And I think because they didn't focus on all of the elements of Adric, Matthew ended up feeling a bit lost and didn't know. Uh, quite where to put himself sometimes and then when they did bring it back so there were a couple of stories where they brought it back suddenly the character that you see in the beginning when he's first introduced and how he chose to play it um it comes back but it's only briefly because i think they couldn't be bothered with the character and they realized the character wasn't as popular as as what they hoped it would be which is how how they wrote him out which was a very definite ending. Sad, but very definite ending. Um, and I, f I just felt he kind of got a bit sidelined and it was a bit unfair and his character didn't get the development that it deserved. A big finish. Um, now, I've not actually listened to any of, of Matthew's stories on, on Big Finish, so I don't know how well um, they've developed the character, but they did introduce Thomas Brewster and they said Thomas Brewster is exactly what Adric was supposed to have been. So I just thought, had he been given the chance and 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 actually focused on as a character and as a valid member of the cast? But isn't it really, then, I think, uh, when when I widen the debate, and I appreciate your example, I know, I know what you're saying. I then yeah. look at Chris Chibnall, a showrunner, mm. and he did the same with some of his companions, didn't he? They had an issue, wasn't developed. Oh, I think you're know, Ryan. It, uh, Ryan, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. so it, it's an interesting one, whether they all have blemishes and masterstrokes. But it's funny when you've said Verity and JNT in different ways, custodians of the show, the, yeah. the best examples. I mean, obviously, I would go, I'd want to go to Philip Pinchcliffe and Robert Holmes. But as people have said in the thread, they they didn't have it a strong enough tenure to pick a doctor to really craft the show for a long period. I think they're a very consistent period, um, and it's one of my favourite periods. But you know, I mean, JNT in the end he picked Peter Davison, he picked Colin Baker, he picked Sylvester McCoy, and I think out of one of at least one of those, you're thinking was a real good casting. You've got Barry Letts and Tom Baker. What a what a masterstroke that was, you know. And you you just look at which producers have had a major influence and a good judgment call. Um, so when I come to you, Hugh, in the end, where where are you going to go on this one? Who's the best custodian? So I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what Rachel said in terms of I mean, I, I I am a as has been said before on here a Verity Lambert fanboy, um, but. I will. I will say this. I think if you're looking for the reason we are talking today, um, RTD won. Yeah. Because I don't think we would sure. be talking about it. I think he brought it back, and it 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 it, it, it wouldn't have lasted. So therefore, the reason we've got it um, 19 years later is because of what he did in the first few seasons. Yeah. Yeah. You can't um, argue that logic. <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, and actually, he continued with uh, JNT's like story arcs and and two parters and all of that. Yeah, mm. so there's a, there's a lot of follow on, and I think you know the the sort of like controversy of of, of now is Russell actually saying it and, and not doing it as clickbait, and whereas previously he did, and and if you're talking about picking doctors. Um, 
I, I, you know, Eccleston was brilliant, and I, the effect. David Tennant's not not my favourite doctor by any stretch of imagination, but the effect that Tennant had on 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 people watching was extraordinary. I'm 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 finding myself torn on so many things. Who have I not brought in yet? I just want to make sure everyone's covered it. Jeremy, have you? Well, uh, I agree with you. Hand? You haven't asked K Nine, who's his favourite producer. <laughs> well, there we go. I, I can have a quick guess. Let me think. It must have been. Um, I mean, well, and definitely because John Nathan Turner brought K Nine and Company. Uh, tried to make a you know a little I series. Did... Yeah, I think it, it goes with the uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so, time scales. What was your thought on who well, are you um, rewarding? I, I, I agree with you. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Dan Hadley in the chat of Type yep. Forty. Howdy, Dan, and thank you. Uh, the Type Forty show was actually the first Doctor Who live panel streaming I ever watched on YouTube. Likewise, so Dan is to fault for getting me addicted to this stuff. <laughs> thank and you, me. but and me. Um, I, I was going to say Verity Lambert <clears throat> because of the fact that. Um, when the show was so young and so small and so fragile um, that if it were not uh, for the fact that she did it right, it may have never even made it past those first couple of years. So I'm going to say Verity Lambert, but I'm kind of surprised myself uh, to be saying this, but I, I agree with what Hugh just said, because when Doctor Who was brought back, if it had not done right, then we, we could have lost it. You know, if, if I, I remember being afraid after learning on, I think, Usenet, that Doctor Who really was going to come back. And I couldn't believe it at first. And I remember being afraid uh, of watching Rose that first time yeah. um, with the CBC leak because I thought that they were going to screw it up. That was my fear after waiting through that 16 years where we didn't have anything except for the 96 movie. I was uh, very concerned that it was going to get screwed up. And, well, guess what? It wasn't screwed up. It was real Doctor Who, and it was back. So um, if I had to pick between the two of them, I'm going to go with uh, what Hugh said, uh, with it being RTD1. One thing I'm going to have to say, because I'm quite surprised at this, I prepared slides and everything, that Barry Letts, remember, was seen as such an overview of Doctor Who that he was brought back to keep an eye on season 18 with j t wasn't he? I mean, yeah. Barry Letts... The BBC felt was a safe pair of hands with Doctor Who. So when when we're calling out custodians of Doctor Who, he was in a way seen by the BBC formally seen as the custodian by Brennan uh, being, being brought back for season eighteen as a kind of executive producer, kind of associate producer role. I mean, and Barry Letts, I ha I always do. I have to give them credit. I can't ignore them. Some of the discussions they had, uh, starting with Terror of the Autons and going through. The master, I said it earlier on, but the master, it's been a character that's been used by everybody. Everybody wants to use the master, whether it's Missy, whether it's Rasputin version. You know, they all are appreciative, surely, of what Barry Letts and Terence Dix invented. You needed the doctor for the longevity of the show to have a Moriarty arch nemesis. I think it's been a spoiled character. I personally don't want the master back for ages. And the fact that he's now been turned into a gold tooth and all the rest of it, unbelievable. And it's a spoiler. And this is the other little argument about producer versus showrunner. All the producers I thought were respectful of the master creation. The deadly assassin, a burnt out husk. The keeper of Traken, Anthony Ainley, was almost emulating Roger Delgado in physique looks and all the rest of it. I thought the producers were respectful of somebody else's creation. I said earlier today, Davros and RTD, not so. And so, you know, when you look at the master creation now, I don't recognise the master now. The master isn't a giggling Gertie. The master isn't a manic, crazed creature. And I, this is where I think the showrunners have just gone off. They've got a toy and they've gone off on it. And so I want to I want to give tribute to Barry Letts and Terence Dix because during that period, they sat down and they thought about restrictions on Doctor Who. I always loved the Blinovich limitation effect in Day of the Daleks. I loved that kind of detailed thinking. And I just think it's lacking now. I just think it's lacking. Um, does anyone want to come in before we conclude on this debate, before we go into the news? Can I can I just say I've really enjoyed this debate because it's one of those ones where it's it's not about what's 
it's not about a yes or no question. It's just right. about getting people's perspectives, and I find it fascinating. And everybody's kind of right, but in their own way. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know exactly. I was sitting here thinking the same thing. You was like, this is kind of cool because everybody's pretty much able to justify why it, it but what we've basically discovered is a lot of these people were just an essential component to the survival of, of the show and the success of it. So it has been really fun talking about. It, 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 it's what we said, didn't I? You know, there's no right or wrong answer, either. right? Right, right, you know, exactly. There's pros and cons for both sides. It, it's like the wrong way to do it. It's just, you know, back in the, at that point, you know, uh, you know, in the classic series, TV and on television was made in a certain way due to the you know, limitations of technology at the time or just in the general way of how things were done. And as we've gone, uh, you know, as, as the years have gone by, we've you know, we picked up influences from other countries and, you know, and we picked up and we learned. You know, from habit to how other people done it, and that, and we've adapted, and you know, for, for good or for worse, you know, it's one of those things, and it, it's, it's it was one of those changes. And like I say, it, it just absolutely benefits pros and cons for, for both arguments, really. And the thread, and the thread have got that we've got so many different ideas. I mean, nobody's agreeing. I mean, I know G and T for his tenure, I have to say, he's got a lot. But we've gone from Barry Letts, Rarity Lambert. Oh, I mean, Philip Hinchcliffe, there's a lot getting mentioned. And, and in many ways, that's what you'd want as a Doctor Who fan, because I'd like to give credit really to everybody who's actually put in on, on Doctor Who. Um, and yes, RTD, I have to say, has done his bit as well. There's some, you know, there's some fun there and there's some, you know, and he did relaunch Doctor Who very well. Let's be honest, he did. Um it's just in this present iteration. Now, for those who've joined us in the in, in the thread, we're, 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 we're reaching an, an interesting interregnum, they'll call it now, right? Which is, I think, um, well, Dan, if he's still with us on from Type 40, has a certain way of putting this, and he's very good at using adverts. We have the Who Pits, who went to Spain uh, to actually emulate the two doctors. I call it an excuse for the thread and our panelists maybe to go and uh, refresh before we really hit the big topics out there. Because I tell you what, I'm dying to hear some of the opinions. I'm dying to hear the thread on, honestly, Millie Gibson, is she in or is she out? Is she really, truly back for good? Peter Davison, don't we all love him? He's actually said his piece, not for the first time, and I love what he said about the bi generation. Jinx Monsoon, who the hell is she in this series? And of course, we've got our predictions 14th Doctors of Valyard, Sue Tech is back, Ruby Sunday is a Time Lord. You can't go away, can you? Well, you can go for a refreshment, but please be back in five minutes, okay? So I'm going to time you. Um, the Who Pet. In Spain, two doctors remake. See you in five. few things gone down the pan i'm not sure what the sense for you i'm just trying to wipe you son can you just leave me for a second us strokers like some peace and quiet for a moment <laughs> what is it walker you've got me in the right tis here granddad why do you look like the mummy from the orient express oh uh, well, yeah, yeah. well you've had me in the right fuff, fuff, you know fussing around here are we What's the story then about the sense for you? Tell me, tell uh, me. Granddad, I'm worried. I heard, overheard Uncle Brendan. Yes, He's worrying yes. about the channel. 
What's I, happened? I don't think you can afford it, and it's going down. It's going down the pan? Yeah. There's the figures and everything, the viewers. We can't lose the sense for you. No. We'll have to come up with a plan. But first, Walkie, I, I think I need to get changed. I can't see, I can't move. I am like the Mummy's Hour Express. Oh. Grandad, Grandad, have you had any thoughts yet? Oh, Grandad, Grandad, have you had any thoughts yet? Not yet, son. I'm in the zero room. What about now, Grandad? I'm just cooling off, son. Still ruminating on it. Shut the door, please. I'm trying to sleep. I've had a terrible night's sleep. I've been dreaming of bells and stuff. It really is bothering me, this. The sense for you. Farce. <coughs> well, Walkie, I've had a damn good think. But you shouldn't be bothering your granddad when he's having his uh, precious sleep and thought time. Anyway, the sense for you can be saved. This is the plan. We go big budget. Big budget. <coughs> we're going to have sex. We're going to have drugs. We're going to have violence. Basically, it's going to be like a 1980s Doctor Who. Bit of resurrection of the Daleks. Bit of Kays of Androzani. Drugs busts. I think that's the future, son. What do you think? That sounds a bit over the top, Grandad. No, you don't understand us classic Who fans know what gets the viewers and the punters in. So, the plan is that... To save the sense for you, we need all those ingredients. We go big budget, and that'll save the YouTube channel, and Mr. Brendan will be very pleased with us, I think. What about that, eh? I think we're on to it. Never fear, the sense for you will be here. Oh, it's the bells of Santa Maria. Son, on the Costa Packet at the Grand Packet Caca Hotel. <laughs> big budget indeed, I tell you what. I have a feeling to go big budget and violence, we need to do the two doctors. Do you remember the two doctors? I do, Grandad, yeah. Oh, yes. Lots of nasty things happened in that. And those bells did give me an indication we needed to go to Spain. So here we are <laughs> on the Costa Packet Grand Packet Caca Hotel. Granddad, I got some great footage for the big budget sensory film that we're doing. Granddad, where? Look, I feel, I feel different this time. What's wrong with me? Oh my God, what's going on? Oh, I feel, Brendan. I feel like, I feel like an androgum. Oh. Ah! Will they die? Does anyone care? No. <laughs> I'm not arguing with those puppets. They, they, they think the sense fee is doing badly. Clear off. I tell you what, they're up themselves. I tell you those lot. So, uh, I think we all feel refreshed now. I'm ready for this. So, of course, I've been baiting everybody all night with these headlines. So, I think it's important they actually deliver on the goods, isn't it? Now, if you like what we're doing, remember, please like and subscribe. You can find us in various places out there. You can find us on X, Instagram, Facebook. We have our own fan community forum. Emulating, I have to say, if Dan's still there, you know, you're, you're the guru on this one. And email at sense3 at gmail. You know, please join us. We are growing and we're enjoying your company. So the first headline uh, today uh, we're going to talk about is this one. Oh, is, she, <laughs> is she back for good or what? Yeah, they said that we all saw the pictures, didn't we? 
Millie Gibson next to Verada Sithu with the doctor in the middle in the same place at the same time oh my god so what is going on and of course we had a few tasty quotes like many doctors who have come before him one is not enough for the 15th and in season two he will have two companions by his side uh, and it goes on says where she's from strapping for the journey blah 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 the usual little bits of hype and you know rtd trying to not say that he's been you know pushed by disney because a lot of people thought oh she's a Dis she's a disney kind of deposit he said he first worked with her in a bbc production of a midsummer night's dream and that's i think he's trying to put that to bed i'll i'll, I'll be honest with you because he knows that people are trying to see where our disney having an impact she obviously says she feels lucky and this is a great moment for her and i don't blame it it's a good series but um does anyone, can anyone read in the tea leaves here? Because I think we can have two truths at once here. They've, they've confirmed that Millie Gibson is in season two with Verada. But I thought I knew that already, that she's coming back to do about three episodes. Is yeah. this is this a nice yeah. manipulation yeah. and a bit of spin? Yeah, it's control. Yeah, it's a bit it, like, it feels um, a bit lean. Uh, we kept seeing reports the last few months <laughs> and all this and all that and the other and of course since this news has come out you've now seen everyone go ha ha see you were wrong well not necessarily you have to sort of pay attention <laughs> to what's actually been said and have two companions for season two yes that, that can still be true but like we also know millie was going to do the first three episodes anyway and apparently she was going to leave or whatever that was yeah and then for the rest maybe verada could come through so that would still technically you know, count as two companions for the season. Um, I can't remember if it says maybe on, on the. It, it, I can't remember if it's anyone in the same. I think the, there's going to be some episodes when they're. Um, yeah, I, I think there's some. That. Obviously, I'll not happen, but I just I, I keep seeing this whole. Oh, well, that. Oh, this proves the fact that she was back. We don't know that she wasn't yet, but. Um, I mean, she's still going to be in the season, obviously. I thought, I think, like you said. But, you know, this doesn't mean that she's not going to be leaving show at some point, maybe June this season, whether it was after the third episode or whatever it was. Um, well, later, know, does everyone else later, later in this, in later in this, later in this discussion, we will. I remind people that me and Rachel have discussed about this one, and I'll get let Rachel score the goal. But what does everyone else think of this news? I mean, it looks like it's good news, but I actually wonder whether it's actually any news at all. Um, any thoughts, you? I was very surprised, and you know, at some point, I thought that they had already filmed the uh, second Shurigatwa season. So when I saw the news that Millie Gibson was only going to be there for uh, one season, I was really confused by that. Um, and it just it makes me wonder. I, it leaves me scratching my head. What in the world happened, and why was there news of her leaving if apparently she hasn't? I don't quite understand how that happened. Now, uh, Rachel and I had talked about this on a previous panel, uh, speculating that uh, maybe she was un under an NDA, which is why she could not say uh, whether or not she had left the series or not. But uh, how did the news get this so wrong that she was leaving and then all of a sudden she's back? Something, something about that uh, doesn't compute. I find it quite funny in this in this report here. I'll just go big screen for a second because there's two elements where it says while there was no official comment from Millie or Shooty, the trio already seemed to have a fantastic end. And at the top it says um, they are clearly giddy and excited as they pose with their arms around each other. Oh, wow, this, that's pathetic reporting. As Jordan has said, uh, body language in those pictures are pulling away as well. Um, <laughs> if we really want to look at it, I mean, mm, I don't know what to read, but I don't think we've learned anything new, but they're pretending this is new news, so to speak, you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with Cinnamon on this. I'm not particularly sure what we know that's more than, than what we knew before. Um, I, I, I do worry about the fact that if this was the case and they didn't want the story to be spun the way that it was when Millie Gibson was was sacked or whatever that they didn't speak out then and say no she hasn't uh, and, and even now it doesn't actually say that but we'll see 
See, I still think we're going to get a time flight moment. You know, I have my theories on RTD and on what formatively affects him creatively. I think there'll be a version of Ruby Sunday seems to leave, a bit like Tegan seemed to leave in time flight. Then we'll see her again for a bit in season two. And this story on the surface looks like everybody's happy, clappy, but I still think they're trying to cover the fact that there's been a bit of disagreement. I still think they're trying to cover for the fact that as, go on, Rachel, your theory on Ruby Sunday, when you mentioned episode seven of the new series, The Legend of Ruby Sunday, your theory was? Oh, good God. Um, (laughs) Which one? That she was a space baby? Well, you had that one, but you also thought she died. Um, uh, yes, that she was not in time and she was removed from um, uh, space and time. Yep. That's right. Hang on a minute. It's in my old notebook, the one that's mixed in it? with all the she's other a, stuff. She's got a special one for sensory now. But honestly, yeah. Rachel, I'll, I'll oh, just... Yeah, 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 I've got it. Yeah, okay, go um, on. Go okay, so it. the legend of Ruby Sunday is that she does not exist in space or time, a bit like Charlie Pollard from the Big Finish stories. Uh, she, okay. I, I theorize that she throws herself into the onslaught to stop all life being extinguished and erasing herself from time, where only the doctor can remember her, which results in him breaking the fourth wall to tell the story, you know, like he does in the trailer. Um, the only recorded memory is his ghost in the TARDIS, and then he tries to get her back into time, the doctor, uh, but is unable to, even though he finds her, so he takes her to a place where she can just exist and be a legend it was quite a theory um but yeah that that was the theory yeah well well retro doc hi hi, retro doc i've seen you on so many streams thank you for joining us i'm i'm chuffed to death millie gibson in season 15 will be cgi (laughs) i mean or AI. ai ai oh yeah yeah anything goes nowadays anything goes i do think i think I mean, and Rachel mentioned Adric earlier, but I do think we're going to have an Adric kind of moment with one companion. She's the only one. And then we have a time flight moment. And then she reappears because he doesn't want to have a Donna Noble moment where everybody goes mad about the memory erasure. So a theory on top of a theory on top of a theory. This is why I love being a fan. But I tell you what, I do. I think they are spinning this. What about you, Brandon? Yeah, something's not right. They they course corrected something, but it's hard to tell what though because so many people are kind of bucking up against a lot of the things that they're doing. Like a lot of the traditional fans aren't very happy with with just the the look of what they're doing, especially after the trailers and everything. So I'm thinking maybe maybe they did fire, maybe they brought her back, maybe it was a swerve or some misinformation. It's just so hard to tell in this internet day and age. You could go ten different directions, but I was pretty surprised because I didn't know I didn't know she was going to be in the second season. I thought it was kind of silly that they were promoting the Doctor hanging out with two companions like it was some novel <laughs> thing. I didn't really get that. You know, it was like, oh well, I guess so because this is season one of a new show. <laughs> shoot me no i don't want you know i don't see it yeah. like that so it, it just didn't make any sense to me why they were saying that to me you know. i think one of the BBC spokespeople actually came out and said this is the first time the doctors traveled with two companions they did Whatever. they did that's what i'm talking about they, the show before the, the, yeah the lady said something along the lines of like ma- making it like this was a big deal you know it, and i figured it was going to say something after it like this is the first time the doctor's been you know teamed with a girl of color born on a wednesday and, and a white lady born on a tuesday you know so this is really yeah, monumental and <laughs> you know, stupid. yeah rachel um i just want to say get these people I would like to say about that article uh, that you just read, that could have actually been done months ago before yep. any of the stuff about uh, Millie got true. out. Very good point. Um, because if she has, if if she has been fired, and but she's still under the NDA, she still can't talk about the fact that she's been fired. She can't yep. talk about yep. it. So it, it could. this could have been months ago before that all happened yeah and as retro doc is saying this news strikes him as rtd spin at disney's behest to limit bad publicity 
And I think we're all tiptoeing down that alleyway, I think. Is there anybody who's challenging that? Well, I'm really surprised about what Rachel just said, because that's something I'd never considered. This article could have been from months ago. Yeah, same yeah. here. I didn't yeah. even stop to think about that. Same yeah, for me never too, thought of that. Yeah, yeah, because um, there are, you, you can, uh, like, give interviews uh, for something, yeah. and there, there's, like, there can actually be a delay. Like, timescales, you, you interviewed someone from Big Finish a little while ago, didn't you? But there was there had to be a delay because he was under an NDA or something. Yeah. Well, um, well yeah. Yeah. Um, and there, that does cause considerable delays. You know, you can yeah. record an interview and it may be a month later um, yeah. before you actually get it finally approved to go live. Exactly. So this may have been done months ago, but no approval had been made for it to go live. And seeing as we're very yeah. close to May. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably why we're getting it now. Yeah, and we need good news stuff. Um, well, well, there you are on that one. I have to say, it seems to me every time I do latest news, there has to be something about Millie Gibson. Bless her. She, honestly, isn't it? It's like she's, what's going on? Uh, she's definitely sacked. Oh, no, she's it back. It, I mean, honestly. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm losing faith with the Doctor Who magazine. I have to say, it just seems like... Uh, yeah, I stopped reading it too. Now I just pick up the collections of the comics when they come out, if I want. <clears throat> so this one, I'm really... I, I, I have to say, there's, I don't know if it's the nostalgia. It's also nostalgia mixed with now. Um, but I have to say, oh, God love him. And happy birthday to Peter uh, Davidson, who's 73. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, oh! Don't you just love him? Um, me and Noel were talking, and, and Noel on Noel's show. Me and Cinnamon were talking about this the other day. Now, my theory is Peter Davison either thinks, look, he's got his pension sorted out. He's a very, very successful actor. He's on West End. He's on television an awful lot, and he just seems to keep going and going. And he's obviously going to be on the Doctor Who convention circuit. So basically. Is he free and thinking he's untouchable or is he just one of those brave actors? Because he's done it before when he, remember, before he did initially say it was a shame that they picked Jodie Whittaker because lads need a male role model um, uh, in fiction. And uh, then it suddenly disappeared. And here he's actually questioning, I'm not in a strong way, but he is actually saying, I don't know why they did the by generation. <laughs> Join the gun. Um, he has some interesting things to say. And the thing I don't really understand, I'm a huge fan of Doctor Who, but I'm not as big as David Tennant. And the by generation basically means I still exist. It's an interesting concept. I don't quite know why they did it. Um, yes, he's trying to make a Who universe. Uh, he's guessing on that one. Um, so he knows I he can. It I was just going to say, I think it's a vehicle to um, be able to bring back the former doctors who are still alive in the age that they are now and explain. For me, it feels like it fits into that Hooniverse thing, like what you were talking about, where that way, hey, we can use Sylvester again, and it ain't weird, like in Power of the Doctor, you know what I'm saying, where, where they're aged up now. That's what I was thinking. Maybe it's one of those weird expansion sort of things. Do you know what? But you, I, and I was saying this on, a, on another stream, the, the thing that I actually find problematic about this as a, well, there's the by generation, of course, but then as Peter Davison's actually saying here, I don't know why he's done it. If it is, as you say, Brandon, because we want a Marvel universe, universe and all the rest of it, but it's not fair because it doesn't cover it properly. You can't bring William Hartnell back. You can't bring Troughton back. You can't bring John Pertwee back. You can't really bring Tom Baker back. So basically, this is like New Who plus the latest one. In the end, in the end, you do just start to wonder whether, was there a motivation behind the bi generation or was it just a nice little wheeze to get to do that binary, binary, binary thing. That's the only well, because Brent, Brendan, if I can if I can disagree yeah. with you on one thing, you said you can't bring William Hartnell back. And no, yes, you can bring well, not William Hartnell, but yeah, you can yeah. bring the first doctor back. Yeah, There's David three Bradley. actors that have performed that role uh so far. So I believe that yes, they can be yeah. brought back. You know, I, I don't know who would portray Patrick Troughton uh properly. His son, David Troughton. Uh -huh. Well, Maybe. yeah, there you go. There you go, but, Rachel. But, do we, but he's an older man, too. But this is what I mean. It, we need to kind of for a mention, I mean, Peter Davison is a fan of Doctor Who. He just says not as big as David Tennant. <laughs> but, it, but the point is, he doesn't understand it. So he's joining a lot of us going, why did you do it? Is it because you're going to do something with the David Tennant 14th Doctor? 
news item coming up in a minute. Or or is it just a great wheeze to link this binary binary thing? Why have you done it? And it doesn't seem like an equal playing field because you can't really bring every doctor back. So it's going to be, oh, more tenant. Ooh, I mean, I don't think, do you know what? From those courts, I don't think Peter Davison can be bothered if he comes back or not, to be honest. I don't think he cares. No. 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 So I don't think he yeah, he'll stick he with the well. conventions, mm -hmm. stick with the voiceover. He's happy doing that. I, I so think he's I think. appearing beyond paradise, currently. Yes. So, so I mean, he's on on. He's not struggling to appear on mainstream television, uh, and he's about to do um, "Kiss Me, Kate." So uh, yeah, he's he's going to problems. He talks a lot of common sense as well. Mm. Uh, agree with him. I did, I did like the fact, fact that he hasn't seen the 60th anniversary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he's just voicing um, the opinions that the other actors have as well, but he's just being the voice. But, but Rachel, you're mm. the actor on the panel. This yeah. is what I really think. Peter Davison is mildly questioning something. He's being yeah. quite polite, really, as his fifth doctor used to be. Do you know what? His top story, as most fans would say, is his regeneration story, the case yeah. of Antizani. Yeah. Jeopardy, sacrifice, heroic. And now the by generation takes all that importance away. It destroys his work. It and does. So, when, so when you look at it, yeah, he's questioning it because he's going, why have you done that? Apparently, I still exist. Apparently, my greater story no longer has any point. I have to say, I think he's been very polite, but I actually think deep down he's thinking, you've absolutely just wrecked everything. You've wrecked my work. But, but I mean, hadn't he already done that by coming back? And... Oh, in that Tales of Tardis thing? Or Tardis. Yeah. Well, no, no. In, in, he was in, in power of the doctor, too. No, I, I'm yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with Tennant. In oh, the yeah. Stephen Moffat thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The little yeah. kids' charity thing or whatever. The short yeah. Yeah. Is that considered yeah. canon? Who knows? With, with the world, but, I mean, I, 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 I think it sort of un undermined it to an extent. It did join to the. It, it it did lead to Voyage of the Damned, though, didn't it? It it, it was a filler. It it, mm. it it could be seen as canon because it conveniently just went from what 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 to the next bit, didn't it? I forgot it did that. And actually, I didn't find Time Crash problematic. I like some of the dialogue in it. Actually, I know there was the issue that you suddenly see a new Fifth Doctor as in older. But like I say, Peter Davison doesn't sound bothered about yeah. whether he comes back or not. I don't think I can hear. So they explain that, that in that in that children need why he was older because of the thing that was yeah. some sort of excuse yeah. that it was a temporary <laughs> shift of them, whatever happened. You know, and I, I know it worked because you know it, that was just a multi-doctor story. It, it wasn't trying to change any sort of law or why he was there. It was just you know a gimmick. I, I, I didn't. But I find it fascinating. But you know, I find it fascinating. I, 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 Go ahead. I mean, one of my points, as I've said, is it destroys his best work and its importance. And it does that for every doctor, of course. But the, but the other thing is, um, uh, what was I going to say? Big one, big one, big one. Um, it misses the point of regeneration. Every regeneration is a moment of atonement, a moment of self-sacrifice, a moment to... I, actually, I used to say, when, when it wasn't you who... Doctor Who was just adventure and story. And suddenly, what you found with the regeneration story is it was about the Doctor at last. And that's all been taken away by this by generation nonsense. No jeopardy, no importance, no value. The whole mystical quality of a regeneration has gone. And there's no um, forced change because you still got both. You got the old Doctor and the new one. There's no not that forced change of theme and... You know what I mean? And personalities and that adaptation because you still got the old. It makes no sense. Yeah. As Peter Davison said. And so, yeah, I think he's speaking for us. And do, do, uh, yeah, my final thing on this, but please come in, everybody, because I'm I'm triggered by this. Um, when you meet a Doctor Who actor, if they go on a TV program and they all get asked about Doctor Who, what do they say? They know they're from Gallifrey. They know they'll mention Gallifrey. They've got two hearts. Their TARDIS is parked in the car park. They know some of the easy bits to do that casual viewers recognise as Doctor Who. 
Will they mention by generation? Will they hell? Will they hell? And I find it interesting that Peter Davison is like going, I don't know what this is. Um, I don't know why they've done it. But he would gladly go on any show. So, oh, yes, I've got two hearts. Oh, yes, I'm from Gallifrey. Yes, I'm a time lord. And that's canon. And this is twaddle. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like the half human thing. Yeah. You think uh, you think RTD yeah. called or RTD yeah. called up? Um, oh gosh, uh, called up Peter Day or called up uh, David Tennant and said, "Hey man, you need to get your father in law in line." <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, well, I joked about whether they have Sunday meals, but it actually says later on in the article that actually David Tennant doesn't watch anything Davison's in, or they don't talk about it, and vice versa. And maybe it's an actor thing within that family that. Because otherwise, they'd just be getting boring with each other talking about work. I mean, do they want to talk about work when they're at home with family? Maybe that's the agreement. Um, so, hello for someone. And didn't it clearly state in the giggle that by generation happens very rarely? Yeah, like it shouldn't happen at all. It's a myth. Or am I missing something? If not, then surely yeah, it's possible no none of the other doctors don't have by generation. But isn't this the problem that it's the Indian leash or it's in the commentary that RTD suddenly says a little bit more? Um, yeah. Uh, so what, what's the retro doc here? What would be the in-story purpose of by generation anyway? Well, we're going to come to it. Don't you worry? I mean, retro doc, there's almost a logic to this. We are going to mention it. What purpose would it serve for the Time Lords? RTD has turned the Time Lords into Tribbles. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Sorry, I'm just thinking about the showrunner and producer. This would have been exactly the sort of thing had it gone on long enough that JNT would have done. Oh, you mean, what? Well, Five <laughs> generation. Oh, would he? I don't you know, know maybe. <laughs> When we when we all talk about J and T and there's all the dis, dis, you know there's all the talk about you know his flamboyancy and that would he have really gone there with this? Um, I what didn't like the, I didn't like similar? I didn't like the look of it. I didn't think it made sense. I think it made Doctor Who look cheap. I mean, the two companions pulling them apart like like you were operating on two conjoined twins. What the hell was this? It. I, I just don't know what the theory is, although we have one retrodox that stay with us. So has anyone got one final thought on the second piece of news there? I agree, Peter Davison. Happy birthday. Enjoy your 73rd. And I have happy birthday to Peter Capaldi. Yes, he's yeah. 66, isn't he? 66. Uh, yeah. right. It's all the Peters. So, um, oh, the next one. <laughs> I think we'll have opinions. Here we go. <laughs> Jinx Monsoon, who changes their name quite frequently. There's the latest spelling somewhere. I've got it up there. Is the maestro. Right. Does that help us? Is the maestro. There was a little bit added to it that Jinx Monsoon's doctor character is revealed in the Devil's Chord. As you know, maestro means teacher, but it can also be translated as master. Oh, 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 apparently. And this is obviously in our good old Beatles episode. Um, and... As for, and, and then we were told some great news that, you know, Jinx came all the way from Broadway, being in Chicago, straight on the plane and straight into the role of the maestro and seemed to enjoy the role quite, you know. It's a performance and a half. She absolutely blew us away. Well, of course, r d would say that. It was so cool to wow, see her transfer her skill set to the show. She fits Doctor Who so well. Well, yeah, it's what type of Doctor Who are we talking about? And I'm just... <laughs> I'm just putting out there. So she she's the maestro. Come on then. What does that mean? What's our theories on it? Well, I actually learned this on Rachel's YouTube channel. Now, the last time we talked about this last week, I had not seen the news story. So when I saw the title card uh, for today's chat, I, it where it said, who is the maestro? That was a really good question for me because I had no idea who the maestro was. Now, I've since read the news story. Um, I watched... Rachel's excellent breakdown, and yes. I'm happy to see Jinx Monsoon um, is going to be on Doctor Who. I'm really happy to see another successful American actor that actually gets to go down in history on Doctor Who. And Jinx Monsoon is American. Uh, she was born in Oregon. She trained in Seattle, and I'm really looking forward to this episode with her in it. And for anybody that doesn't know about her career, just check her out on Wikipedia. Now, um, I had a theory when I realized uh, that maestro means mastro, 
um, which goes back to the the piano design in the costume because it made me think of back when the TARDIS was a piano. Well, I was totally wrong. It, it was a pipe organ. And that was a Cybermen episode uh, back in the Colin Baker era. So I thought that Jinx, I immediately thought that Jinx Monsoon was going to be the, uh, the master. You know, somebody has the gold tooth. So the master is still out there somewhere. But since I think that there's way too many indications pointing towards Jinx Monsoon being the master to just completely throw us off. And while I initially thought that she was going to be the master, I think that when this episode airs, we're going to find out that she's not. No, I, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah 100% is not the master. Now, Jeremy, I do want to, Jeremy, I know. <laughs> Thank you, John Yulden. Um, it's an alternative universe, Turlo. Uh, Retro Doc is trying to work it out, obviously, with uh, if, if, because some people do think it's Jinx Monsoon's maestro character has picked up the master tooth at the end of the giggle, then obviously it can't be the master. Um, Jeremy, are you, are you excited by the maestro and what she is? No, not really. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, either it'll be a very good episode, a classic episode, or it'll be like a, a very long trip down a long winding road. <laughs> <laughs> What, what are your tea leaves telling you? Um, uh, well, my tea leaves in my tea bag uh, are not telling me anything. But but the feeling of it is, is it, she just re uh, reminds me of a, a 1960s villain out of Batman. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah. It feels very much kind of comic -y book type uh, of a story. What but um, it might be very good. It might, I, might, I might be completely wrong, and I might I might like it. But um, I, I hopefully that Jinx Monsoon is not going to play the master. Um, and that's that's my opinion on it, though. Yeah, I mean, this is a location shot uh, from actually the Devil's Chord, so it, it gives you a little bit more about the character. We actually see the full costume here, um, and you can see. Um, I think it is right to say, I think it's going to be, it is a performance and a half. It looks like a performance and a half. Whether that is what they want, because obviously we don't know. We're just guessing. And I, like I say, I'm not saying anything about having a drag queen in it at all, actually. And what I'm saying is I don't know if the characterization as I'm seeing it is what I want from Doctor Who. I still get those late 1980s vibes of Panto, of Ken Dodds, that kind of thing. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I want to be wrong. I want to love Doctor Who. But that looks like Disney characters, that Ursula. That looks like Corella Deville. Some yeah. say it's a version of Bette Midler. You know, it. it I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 the the maestro thing is interesting because it is so obvious that you know you go it can't be because it's too obvious. In which case you then right. go maybe it is because it's too obvious that they would do <laughs> some. They'd have to do something else. Um, I yeah. I mean, I, I I'm. I ended up trying to work out whether because Carrie Mulligan appears married to Leonard Bernstein in the film Maestro, whether there's any connection there. But that's what you end up doing in these things. You go around in circles and go a bit mad. You can. I mean, we all know this seems to be the musical episode and you see the doctor in one of the trailers singing. You see them all dancing in the recording studio. Yeah, that's Obviously, inside the actual recording part of Abbey there. Because look, you can see McCartney's bass in the background. Yes, yes, and 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 you you, you do see. Oh, come back to that. You do see. Um, I've got it somewhere. Ba, ba, ba. I'll come back to it. I, where you've got a shot of the Beatles, but you've got the Doctor singing and dancing. You've got lots of people singing and dancing. As time scales is as said, and it says in the article that. Jinx Monsoon's just come from Broadway, singing and dancing. So this does seem to be the slam dunk musical episode. And obviously it's about the Beatles, so therefore it kind of fits. Um, it's just, is it going to therefore, because as Rachel said, I don't know where and what stream, but we when I asked you as an actor about musicals, which you, you have a musical theatre background, don't you? Yeah, I do, um, to my degree. And as I, as, I said, as I said to you, my theory on that is... It's more of a heightened acting, isn't it? Yeah, like when you get to a certain point in time within the show, you can't find the words to continue, so then it breaks into song, and it's the song that does the storytelling for you. 
that's essentially the 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 purpose of having the song there. Some songs though serve a different purpose, and that could be because there's something going on that they need to change behind the behind the set, and they're generally quite a, a you know entertaining, but not always a um, serving to a plot. So it could just be quite and quite a filler. I, you know, it's not the best way of putting it, but. Um, uh avenue q is a good example um i'm not wearing underwear today i am but you know the song is i'm not wearing underwear today yeah. and he just uh brian the character just randomly comes on sings this like two minute song it's really short it's really random and then the set and then um his wife yells at him get off or get a job or something and then suddenly the set changes the set's completely different so it was it was a filler so they they all serve a different purpose but the main purpose is to tell the story now now rachel you've yeah. said this to me before on a previous stream but help melanie western out she's asked there is a devil called right her character has something to do with it and you've yeah. obviously looked into this haven't you yeah there is a devil's called uh it's it's one um it's a it's a tritone you can play it on the guitar but i'm pretty sure you can um play it on the piano as well it's known as the devil's monica i think monica have i got that right hang on a minute let me I'll check i've pronounced that correctly um i never know let me just check uh sorry musica sorry musica i knew i knew i got that wrong um and it essentially it's there's like this theory behind it that if you play the tritone that the, the the devil's chord it, it creates such a like scary haunting like weird sound that it can like summon the devil mm. that's what they used to believe that it could it could do that yeah like on the guitar band, i think was actually accused of that <laughs> yeah they were on <laughs> guitar too when you try to play it you have to spread your fingers so far because you're playing like two two octaves above one note to the other to the C and then your two octaves above. So like I, I you had to stretch your hand. I, it never summoned the devil, but I, I got a laugh out of it. No, but <laughs> apparently Black Sabbath um have played the, the devil's called for some of their stuff. I don't know if that's true, but now when I come to the other item, I'll say what my theory is if you haven't seen one of our earlier shows. But um I, I do think Jinx Monsoon's Maestro fits into something else and it's nothing to do with the master at all. Um, yeah, I is it a sarcophagus, it. Brandon? <laughs> um, I, 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 I mean, why would I say that, Brandon? Why would I say that at all? I mean, you know. <laughs> um, Funny enough, my theory as to who Jinx is might actually tie in with this sarcophagus as well. Oh, you see, I think we're leading to this item. <laughs> we're not doing it once. So those who've maybe just joined us and have never seen our streams for, for a while, we have done a few on trailers, like everybody has. I know we're not special, but we like to think we've got some really interesting theories and they're not just made up. Um, I have really gone big. I, I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> but if you go to our, our stream on Sutex Returns to Doctor Who, I've got loads of clues where I think when we get to the Empire of Death, I do think there's a strong chance it's somebody as big as Sutek. It goes into the gods and the fantasies, and I won't say too much more because, like I said, please just have a look at that and you'll see our theories. We also said when we looked at the trailers, is it the meddling monk coming back? Is Jodie coming back as a cameo? There were various things we were talking about. We've also said, and, and I will lead into this news item, that Ruby Sunday could be a time lady. We've also said that the 14th Doctor is the Valyards. Now, um, who wants to start off on their theories on where we're going with this? Because there's plenty here and um, there's some tasty ones with some good actual clues with them. Everybody. I think, I think one, one thing in terms of this is there's been speculation that um, the Jinx Monsoon character, Maestro, is effectively the boss of the meep and the person, the one who waits and stuff. That seems too early. So I think you, the one who waits has to be in the last of uh, in, yeah. in in terms of that. So I think that that would be something um, because we're we're talking here about a big bad as the the thing comes. And and just to to look back, I did want to mention earlier, in terms of the showrunner stuff, the very fact that 
it was Bad Wolf in the first one just indicates how much of um, how much RTD wanted to be Joss Whedon. Because <laughs> Big Bad came from Buffy and Big Bad Wolf. I mean, uh, that just ridiculous. Yeah. So theories, everybody. I mean, I can explain them all, but I don't want to dominate this. But, you know, they've been said by various people. I clearly have said Sutek is my hunch. I've said that the meddling monk might be back, and I've shown lots of reference to that in our earlier trailer. Uh, the Ruby Sunday is either dies, she goes into an alternative universe like E Space or something, the legend of Ruby Sunday. There is that element where, of course, because um, she stood on a butterfly, changed time. And I think the doctor will probably stick to that truth that you can't go back and change time again. So basically, how does he save her? And, and you heard Rachel's theory earlier that she becomes a legend in an alternative universe or something like that. Now, the other version is the space baby version, because I actually said, and I was only half joking, that those space babies could be timeless children. Mm. It is very, very possible. Um, and she obviously is a bigger myth than just a companion age 19 from Britain. She's clearly bigger. The foundling thing was labored in the church on Ruby Road. The uh, and and the, the mystical person who, who yeah. leaves her. Yes, exactly. Therefore, she's obviously bigger than just a normal human. The Mrs. Flood at the end of that episode saying, you haven't seen a TARDIS before. Mm. There's obviously theories that she is Mrs. Flood, but I don't know about that one. But basically, that's why I'm saying she's possibly a Time Lord, because she has seen a TARDIS before. Um, the, the, there's something timey-wimey going on here. Maybe the version that doesn't recognise that TARDIS is the version that's been affected by the book. You know, I think there's something going on here. And that's why I said this narrative arc, oh, sorry, this character arc is quite crucial. I think we're being misled in so many different ways with the Verada Sithu and all the rest of it. She's, Millie Gibson's character is vital for the two seasons. I'm, I'm sure of it. I just think she's, like to say, she's not in all of them. And I don't think it's necessarily about bad stuff. I think the plan is, you know, there's an abrupt juncture, you know, there's an abrupt kind of disconnection, and then there's a reconnection maybe in a different way. But, you know, I'm talking the way here in the thread. Does anybody else want to come up with their theories on this one? Because there's loads there. Um, well, Brendan, I, I think that Millie Gibson will be in all of them because that's probably how she was contracted. I, I can't see her being hired to do just a couple of episodes. And if she's a companion, she's a companion. So I expect to see her in all of them. Um, now, uh, Rachel's theories are the ones that have made me think the most. How and, dare you? you know, with, uh, <laughs> with, with, with the mic, and thank you, Rachel. Oh, and with the maestro possibly being the master you know, I think that is way too extremely obvious, which is why I think that we're being misled a little bit. You know, all in good fun. We'll be surprised. Now, as far as the space babies Sorry. being timeless children, I think that also is probably too obvious of a conclusion. I, I hope they're not. But uh, I, I think that that's another uh, situation where fans are speculating on what may appear to be really obvious only for us to find out that we were completely wrong <laughs> he did say he would get a character back from decades ago hence why i went for something like sutek we've gone down the fantasy road we've right. gone down this god's road hmm. and that's why i think that the jinx monsoon maestro is t like like hugh said it's like a double double bluff that it's too obvious that it's right. a master, so therefore is it the master? But I actually think in the end, these are all agents of a greater evil power, all of them. The toy maker uh, obviously said there was a greater power, the one who waits. You've then got, I think, this Jinx Monsoon character, as Hugh said, comes too early on to spoil the narrative arc. And so I think these are all agents of evil, and the great boss clearly will be in the climax at the end. And so to be greater than the toy maker to be greater than the master, to be greater than all these mortals needs to be a god or an eternal or something. Hence why I went for that one. Um, John is going for Omega. How dare you? Time Lords. Brandon will be <laughs> pleased. He's, he's up for the Time Lords coming back. Um, however they look nowadays. <laughs> um, as long so as they're not in cyber armor, Amara. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, what about the 14th Doctor being the Valyard? Because, like I said, Rachel, you go for it. You mentioned this. I don't want to keep talking because it's, it's unfair. But, you know, um, that was one of the theories out there. And we discussed this, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Because, um, obviously, we... I don't know if they will do the Valyard. But it is a possibility. Um, because, obviously, David Tennant's Doctor, he's sort of retired isn't he you know and um there's theories that he might actually be the value but we're also theorizing that uh it's possible that shooty may start like experiencing like the craziness of the value as well um yeah and then like uh like maybe like by regenerate and then there's like his value his dark side running around and he has to like uh, compete off against him or something. But so, so, so you're in I, presume, I presume the thing is with by regeneration and the stuff that we're talking about, the Valyard can come back because he's a valid version of the Doctor. Yeah, and I was, I was, I was ruminating the other right. day that if the Fourteenth Doctor is broken, and and you know broken, yeah, I'm going to be lazy in, with my English just for the sake of concision, but. A broken character, then we have a possibility that that broken character can rear from what they normally act like. And because I keep trying to think, why the hell would you mess with by generation unless there's a reason? And RTD, I don't think, just just concocts things. So it would be, and it, the Valyard said he was between the 12th and final incarnation of the Doctor. So we're in that territory now. And it would be very interesting. And why would David Tennant come back? Just to do the specials because he's a fan or to be challenged as an actor where he plays a very different Doctor. Would every Doctor Who actor come back to play the Valyard? I think so. Mm. God, uh, Capaldi would be so awesome. <laughs> Imagine him being evil and those eyebrows and they could just say, hey, man, we're going to let you take this because you're a fan too. You know what to do with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would I would love for him to be the Valiar. That would be so cool. I've never seen David Tennant's Doctor, apart from a bit in the waters of Mars, as a kind of angry character, as in properly angry all the way through. You know, I, I can, I've seen him shouting that, but Waters of Mars was the most interesting one for the change um if we went down that road but we do people are asking is the valyard coming back just like the rani and everything it's a shame michael jason you know poor soul I, I you know it's a shame because he was such a distinctive voice and character but would they bring somebody like the valyard back but the door is open with a broken doctor i i, I just i can't I personally just can't see it. It's like you said there. It's it was between the twelfth and the final mm. regeneration, and we've and we've passed that. We've we passed that years ago. Um, I, I'm just trying to stick with the rules. Um, but then again, it's Doctor yeah. They're always changing their own rules, I suppose. Um, well, definitely recently. Um, that, that's how I'm sticking with it. Anyway, that, that final incarnation was between Tennant and, and Smith. That was where it was. And again, good off their rules. You know, we passed that. But, I mean, never say never. Pause, but I'm just trying to, you know, I'll play it by their rules. And it's just that I, RT... I, I think out of all of them, the suit tech will be fixed the most, to be honest. I will, yeah, I, will I, I think I think I should have actually uh, put a proper bet on that. Uh, but but on the Valyard one, I'm just thinking creatively if I was a writer, if I was an actor, and I, I, I really do think there's some credit in doing that because. You know, RTD learned from what he did to Donna Noble. He learned what he did to Harriet Jones. He learned that actually that when you saw that prime minister humiliated by what he did at the end of um, the Christmas invasion, um, he then, you know, made her a better character in the end. He also realized that the Donna Noble memory erasure, we all hated. And so I think he wanted to jump at the chance to kind of settle that. I can't imagine why would RTD want to make the David Tennant popular doctor look like that, you know, doing the weeds. And I can't imagine that's how he wants it to look. There must be another reason. Um, what about uh, this? 
It might not work actually now that I think about it, but what about the Guardians? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, and I, I, I'm trying to remember who said it in the retro doc. Could the maestro be the Black Guardian? Could yeah, yeah, very much so. Oh, yeah, I didn't even I didn't make that connection. I thought uh, she might have been uh, something else, but yeah, like um, but but actually, with the with the Guardian, if if Maestro was the Guardian, Black Guardian, um, would she actually be controlled by a higher power? Is that possible for ha to happen to a Guardian? Uh, it depends know. on who's telling the story because remember I said to you guys <laughs> we, were, we were talking we were talking yesterday I said I had read something in like the magazine comics or something where they were saying like maybe the the white and black guardian were dispatched by Razalon and the other Matrix Lords or something I, I don't know about that but I'd like to see them again that would be cool well plenty of theories we haven't even mentioned the Susan one but there's plenty going there lots a lot of news going on at the moment so one of our last headlines uh, just to keep you uh, happy with where we are was all the uh, discussion about and it, this one is from the Empire magazine Doctor Who's Beatles episode sprang from an age-old problem with trying to do a Beatles episode is the headline and of course RTD obviously partly trying to hype up the new series explains his inspiration for the devil's chord and of course he said it's all wrapped up up in the copyright issues of the Beatles. And so he says, you know, um, the notion of doing a Beatles episode has always hit a, a certain stumbling block, but that in itself became a source of inspiration. And you instantly, you can never play Beatles songs on screen because the copyright is too expensive. So I'm thinking, how do you do a Beatles episode without Beatles music? And then it becomes the entire plot. That's where the idea came from. It's all about copyright law. Um, and it came from a conversation that proved to Davis that the legacy of the Beatles still has meaning to younger generations because he was talking to somebody, da, 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 da. So I don't want to kind of just read at people. I don't like doing that. But basically, time scales. You have theories? You have thought? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah um, the This is the first time I've seen that article. I, I was aware that it existed, but I, I had not actually read that yet. And when it comes down to it, this has already been done before. It's been done successfully by Big Finish. Um, there is no reason to actually have to have the original studio recordings of the Beatles to make a Doctor Who story. And I have an example. Um, Big Finish number 178, 1963, Fanfare for the Common Men. This right here was written by Eddie Robson, who is one of the most talented Doctor Who writers ever. If you're not sure who Eddie Robson is, um, check him out, wiki him, go to Big Finish, type in his name, and you're going to see a huge amount of works in Doctor Who. Now, this particular story, Fanfare for the Common Men, um, this came out in September of 2013, um, uh, which was one of Big Finish's contributions to the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who. There were several other stories to go along with these. Um, this right here is one of the highest rated Big Finish stories by all of the ratings and reviews on the timescales at least. And I have listened to this three times. Uh, once I, I listened to, to most of it last week because I was really curious ab about this very topic. How in the world can you have a Doctor Who story about the Beatles without Beatles music? Well, in this case right here, we would have to thank Howard Carter. Um, Howard Carter, and we're looking at the uh, the, the uh, cover to the left here, Fanfare for the Common Men. Howard Carter um, has also done a tremendous amount of audio work uh, for Big Finish. And uh, he did both the music and the sound design for this. And when listening to it, it's extremely enjoyable because some of the music, in my opinion, might actually be superior to that of Beatles songs. And with, with the Beatles, there have been tons of cover bands over the years that actually perform live. And a lot of these cover bands will create original new pieces that were not written or ever performed by the Beatles. And for someone attending a concert of a cover band, you might, you might never know. Um, so Doctor Who stories absolutely can be made without original Beatles music. Now, if you look over to the right, introducing the Ruddles, okay, th this was a joke on X <laughs> yesterday, uh, thanks to the talented British author, Andy, Andy Lane. And there's actually a joke inside of his joke, and let me let me explain that. 
Um, the Rudels are actually a parody band of the Beatles. Um, their, their, their songs may, they could possibly be considered as covers, um, but they're also parodies. Now, if you look at, at the upcoming uh, Doctor Who episode, The Devil's Chord, since the actual Beatles are not in it, in a way, the episode is going to be a parody of the Beatles. So therefore, it would be better to have music, which is also a parody of the Beatles, instead of the original recordings. And for any diehard Beatles fans, everyone's already heard the studio recordings, and they're not going to change because they're static. They're not live. They are what they are. And do we really need to hear an original Beatles studio recording in a Doctor Who episode when there can be other newer, more creative music put in its place, such as parodies or covers? So the answer may be a little bit uh, uh, complex there, but the original Beatles recordings, the copyrights, and all of the costs that may be involved are absolutely unnecessary because it's been done before successfully. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I'm not big on Big Finish, so I, I, I'm lost when it comes to that. And obviously your reference to the joke that came around uh, yesterday. So uh, I thank you for that because I was none the wiser at the time. Um, so are you, are you, did you see the point about the showrunner versus producer debate we had earlier and i was saying sometimes the producers had tight budgets etc cetera, etc cetera. they had to move to pebble mill they had constraints and actually actually our showrunner rtd is saying this constraint of copyright law he's actually been inspired by i'm all for that i'm all for that jeremy well i i thought that they had a really big budget so, oh yes but uh, copyright no, <laughs> but 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 uh, you know, the real challenge is actually to have a Beatles track, even if you only have a, a, a short uh, snatch of a Beatles track. And I think that is that is the challenge. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, we've had Beatles music on Doctor Who before with uh, Ticket to Ride, Paperback Writer. Um, I know that in, uh, the audios, they've had to edit some of it out or they've had to pay up. Yeah, and and there's there's no excuse really for BBC to say, well, we can't afford it. You know, um, I think it detracts, it detracts from the story because people are going to say, well, where's the Beatles music in all this? Even if you had some sort of generic music, Beatles music from George Martin, for instance, uh, which which you could have, um, but I mean, in, in this day and age now, it, it's kind of like you know they should come up with a special deal with EMI. Whoever owns the rights to Beatles music. To, to I looked it up it. yesterday, yeah. Jeremy, on when we were doing Culture Accounts. So I believe Sony owns it now. And you know, yeah. do you, do you, would you say is there any chance that maybe yeah. they're swerving us, and you know, maybe there will be a snippet of a song, you know, in there somewhere? I wonder if, oh. if maybe there. I mean, I, could, I don't. Could very well be. Yeah. Uh, okay, so to add to that, um, I was just looking at oh, just to get some sort of idea as to perhaps what it it would actually be and according to the telegraph yesterday the the beatles film in order to get some of the copyright they paid 10 million 10 what? million 10 million dollars according to that and that was 26 million uh, their production cost was 26 million dollars that's nothing mickey spends 10 million on liquor he could, he could, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, true, true. <laughs> he spends 15 million on beer. He could, um, he could afford the 10 million to help out the BBC. Easy. Yeah. And then I was looking at something else yeah, and um, how Michael yeah. Jackson bought the publishing rights to the Beatles. It was an excess of $1 billion. And that was as of 2020. <laughs> so maybe the devil's card is they play one note of a Beatles song because that's all they can afford. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, just in terms of, of, of having something where you're looking at what happens to Beatles music, then obviously there was the film yesterday. Yes. Um, yes. Which, where the Beatles music had to be reinvented, but they still played some of the stuff. And I don't think that was big budget. True. True. Mm. No. Uh -uh. 
Oh, so well, as far as the budget, there's also, also go back there's also the a license for use fee. Just like Shakespeare as well. I sort of about Shakespeare, and it wasn't about a particular play he did. It was more about the law that never happened. That it was based off a real thing. And again, with the Agatha Christie thing, you know, the fact that she went missing and Gareth Roberts kind of exploited that. But oh, I'll use that in my script. So, you know, and I can see that about, about this. And it seems like Russell's done that. It's... I, 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 I'm not sure if it, uh, Greg, you said there, man, the Beatles might uh, not have be in it. So I thought they were. Um, I'm so I'm not quite sure now, but um, they are in. Yeah, so you could either way, you could still have the Beatles in it, and you could, you could say like this, you know, my going around with or whatever, or, you know, exploit that and delve into that a little bit, you know, the music going missing, historical stories, isn't it? So you can do well. Yeah. It was, it was the, the, thing, the thing that you sort know, of disappoints it, it, me about this it, the thing that sort of disappoints me about it is that it really should be the Rolling Stones so as they could have Goodbye Ruby Tuesday and go actually Sunday walks better yeah. <laughs> Yes, I know there's puns there aren't there oh, it's a shame So look, I, I'd sympathy for the devil surely that, that's something you wanted <laughs> oh well we've already had I've got the devil in oh, me that was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, well, I know I, I must admit I, we were saying the other day weren't we about um, he does like to bring music back and so you wonder what music he is. Called. You know, we've got Spice Up Your Life with the Toy Maker, which I never would have joined together. Um, we had Rasputin with the Master. Well, yes, I can see that lump. I never thought I'd have born the M with the Master. Though. I never thought I was going to get that. So, yes, who knows, as they all say. Can I just say that um, they did play uh, David Bowie music. David yes. Bowie. Right. Yes. For, for the trailer. That's right. That's right. Ooh. So they must yeah. have had to pay some copyright fee for that in itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, sure here's the thing about the trailer. The trailer is something that is used temporarily, and there will be no use for. In fact, it won't even make it to DVDs. So they could uh, do a one-time license to use the David Bowie music without any concern for physical media in the future. Yeah. Now, as far as licensing the Beatles songs, if they were to be broadcast on television uh, when this episode comes out, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a snippet of actual real original Beatles music in the background, but these episodes are going to be available on uh, physical media uh, probably shortly after their broadcast. And in the past, they have had to change the music that was used for the rights for use for perpetual physical media. Oh, yeah. So I think that's where it differs with the use it, of the David Bowie music. Would, I think that was a one-time license thing as opposed to being something perpetual it use would be, of the Beatles property. It would be amazing when you think of the chase in the 60s. Doctor Who, Dalek mania, it was a classic 60s moment. The Daleks are down there as a 60s icon and Doctor Who riding on that. I think there was an element of that. Then you've got the Beatles and when you got in the chase that weaving of two british icons together pop culture icons and you know yes i would love to get the beatles back in doctor who i know the characters are there but a bit of music and doctor who you'd think yeah we're hot to trot this is when doctor who's flying um because yeah, I can get it. I wasn't around in the 60s when they did that, but I can see how Doctor Who's riding high, the Daleks are riding high, the Beatles are riding high, and they're dovetail for a lovely little moment in Doctor Who. I'd, I'd love to have that again. We might get a Ringo or Paul cameo. I guess there's always the chance. You know, <laughs> It's possible, but, is, but they're still alive. Is it Ringo in that drum? You know the drum with the face that's banging around. <laughs> I, I do wonder about that one. But I mean, you may well, get, you know, they may say, "Hey, since we weren't, since they wouldn't let us do it the first time, that it might be a funny, cheeky, probably is what you guys would say thing to show up for just a couple <laughs> seconds for a cameo." Right. So, bit of marmite before we all go home, go to bed, or if you're in America, I don't know what time of day you are now. About I don't know. So it's almost um, five in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's almost two o'clock in California. Now. Just like Millie Gibson coming up every week, this piece of merchandise I, either delayed or it's reviewed or whatever. So I'm not going to milk it again, but it's funny. When I watch streams, everybody sees it as Marmite. I actually am looking forward to this. And I think, you know, it's got enough on it. I like what they've done with it. 
It's uh, by the way, if nobody knows, it's the tenth of June. At last, we're going to get it. So seeing this artwork Finally. at last, you just start to see. Yeah, I always go too far with my buttons. I get excited. So basically, Ooh. I mean, I think the surreal quality of the illustrations really will work for the celestial toy maker. And I understand there's a lot of arguments out there about the animations. I get it, and it's not as simple as me just saying one way or the other. Um, because I've argued in the past that I'd like them to be a house style. But then again, I've just argued against that by saying I like this surreal quality because the toy maker is very studio bound and very 60s studio bound. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, God. Um, so basically, um, I'm looking forward to this and I want to give it a go. And I'm not the first to kind of prejudge and always criticize to me, it looks all right. Does everybody as go on, Jeremy? Um, I, I think it looks hideous and awful. <laughs> I, I, I have to be honest, I, the, the animation is absolutely horrendous, and I'm surprised that they've actually let this go forward. I'm surprised they've actually released it. And I have to, I have to agree with Ian Laverne, uh, Levine yeah. that it is diabolically bad. Um, uh, but but as I said, you know, they've released. They're going to release it. So, um, but I'm surprised they haven't pulled it. it. It it's a funny one. I know. I said it was marmite, and I understand. I'm I'm not trying to persuade anyone. I, I understand what you're saying. It it is marmite, isn't it? It really is. And retrodoc. The more I see this cover, the more I like the art. I mean, oh, I don't know. Is anyone else, Rachel? It's a nice steel It's a nice. Sorry, cinnamon. What did you say? I was just going to say it was an, it's a nice steel book. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's a different animation style. That's definitely for sure. I, I'm trying to put it into context. I'm okay with the presentation too. Yeah, it's more three D. Yeah, it's it's more of a three D animation style, isn't it, compared to what we were getting? The previous mm -hmm. animations that they've done were all somewhat similar. There's been different teams, but they still looked kind of the same. Whereas this is completely like way off. Um, but I also um, at the same time. I don't. I, I, I've seen a lot of people say they absolutely hate this. I, I'm not. I'm not really sure myself. I, I'll be watching it in black and white because I can't watch it in color because that's just that's just me. I like to watch it how it was probably intended. But you know, this, this, is, a, this is a very very visual story. Um, and when you listen to the actual audio of the story, it is quite difficult at some points to make it out because you'll hear these grunts of Stephen hopping on different things, and it's, it's very visual. You have to look at it. Yeah. So I, I'm, at the same time. I'm just lucky and glad that we finally get to watch it all because this is one of my favorite stories. I really like this one. It was always such a big one of his era. So the, the fact that we get to watch it, I'm, I'm just happy with that. To go on. So as I come to you, Rachel, I'm, I'm, I'm upset as I'm coming to you, Rachel, as I, I, what I'm interested here is what Cyber Strike says as well. I'm not sure if it will hit the target audience. Purists won't like it. Younger audiences may not be enamored with it. Now, we know what's going on in Doctor Who overall. Look at the Daleks in color where it was chopped some hated the edit some hated that music um is this what they're doing to kind of make the celestial toy maker you know acceptable uh digestible what with the an with the animation yeah because it, is this like uh, a daleks in color element here where they're just trying to make it as as cyber matt strike said that they they're not going to please the purists but you yeah. know are they trying to get the younger audiences by doing something like this? The animation possible. style is so Clone Wars. It's so Star Wars Clone Wars to me. Just looking at the face, <laughs> that, you know, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah. It's terrible. They, they can't strive away from the old, you know, old stuff. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. They can't, they can't, they can't strive away from like classic who in, in, in a sense, it still has to look, yeah. Old. It still has to look uh, retro. You know that kind of thing. Contemporary. Contemporary. Yeah. Era. Um, it has to fit in with the era that it's come from. So they are limited by that. Obviously, they're doing it in color. Now, that's not a norm. That for that era wouldn't be a normal thing. Which is why I understand what Cinnamon saying that he, he would have to watch it in in black and white, and that's fair enough. But maybe um putting on the color versions may entice some younger audiences because obviously they're not used to black and white 
Um, maybe that's what they're trying to get at. I was going to say something else, though. Go on. Um, yeah, all right. So I watched the trailer. Personally, I wasn't too keen on the trailer for it, you know, the animation and all of that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I, and I made a video on it. But afterwards, I began thinking, and I was like, do you know, there's one positive thing about these animations. All of these animations that we're, we're getting um, are because the stories are lost. And if those children in the 60s, 70s, 80s hadn't have actually recorded it with their little yes. phone or whatever they had, we wouldn't even yeah. have this today. I mean, we're obviously, uh, maybe they would struggle to get it today. So they get the, you know, the recordings that the children had, um, some voice actors who are good at doing impersonations and just bringing it all together so that we, as viewers who never got to watch the 60s to 70s uh, lost stories, actually get a chance to, to see it. And I think sometimes people forget that a lot of work goes into compiling all of that together and um, they're doing it for our benefit. And I think, I think that's an amazing thing to actually do. And I, I mean, appreciate that. Well, they're doing it to make money because it's a commercial venture. Well, true. Right. True. But, but right. It's for everyone. Yeah. But, 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 but you've got to look at the quality of it and why anybody who was in charge looked at it and said, I'm sorry, but this is just not good enough. It is, it is certainly not up to any kind of standard. That I can well, it's budgeting. It, it, it's, it's budgeting is what it is. BBC America was actually backing the restorations of the missing episodes into animation at some point, and then they quit. Now, um, I understand Ian Levine's position on this, belief that the missing episodes should be restored back to being as authentic as possible. Exactly. Okay? And this animation is obviously not authentic to the original Celestial Toy Maker. Now, um, with with there being budgets, uh, I don't I don't believe that BBC or Disney have gotten into AI restoration um, of the missing episodes. But he's of the belief that they should stay true to the originals. Okay, I get that, and yeah. I, I understand his contention there. But there is one really positive thing about this. At the end of the day. Thanks to some fans out there for recording these audios off of television, Doctor Who is complete 100% in audio yeah. form. Now we've got we've got yeah. the missing videos, but with the animation, I don't personally care what it looks like myself because of the fact that the audios still exist and these missing episodes can be remade in different formats ai and or animation at any time in the future and i think that the technology is getting up there to where it can be done better and better and better and it may take 10 20 years but eventually we may have the celestial toy maker back extremely true to its original form where it actually feels like we are watching it on TV uh, back before it was unfortunately jumped. So I'm just happy that we still have all of the audios. Well, let's end on that positive note. We've given a lot of our time. I thank everybody on the panel, uh, your contributions, your thoughts. It wasn't a straightforward debate. It wasn't a straightforward one. It was so complex, so many different ways to go. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Thank you to the, the people on the thread. So many people, so many ideas. It's because we love who. Anyway, good night, everybody. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.